UFC 177 may have had a weak lineup, but don't worry, your buds from Australia have you sorted for the next couple of hours. Welcome to another exciting episode of Submission Radio. It's August 31st. As always, I'm Dennis Kratov here with Kaspar Zalowski, and today's show has a touch of legend, doesn't it, Cas? It absolutely does. It's almost like the legend special. Uh, UFC and mainly WWE fans will be fami familiar with good old Jim Ross. JR will be joining us on the show. He's obviously at UFC Tulsa the previous weekend. The guy has a wealth of knowledge. For those who think he was just a WWE commentator, you couldn't be more wrong. He was obviously the head of talent relations for many years. A lot of crazy stories, a lot of insider knowledge on the industry in general. Uh, speaking of legends, we've also got Dan. Dan Severin on the show. Now, uh, just quickly, we interviewed Dan the other day. Dan's a really busy guy, so we had to fit him in, did a pre-record, and uh, it's a long interview. The guy goes in, in depth into a lot, a lot of things. I mean, a lot of inside things into the early UFCs, the whole drug testing thing, the PEDs, his career, just a ton of stuff. So what we've got is a little, basically, tidbit of the Dan Severn interview on here. That's going to be coming up in uh, sort of the second half of the show. But we're going to be kicking off the uh, show with Jason Perillo. He's going to be on our show. He obviously coaches guys like Tito Ortiz, BJ Penn, uh, Michael Bisping. He's held pads for pretty much everybody in MMA. And we want to clear his name. You know, the guy caught a lot of shit for the BJ Penn game plan. We want to chat to Jason because what people may not realize, he didn't actually have anything to do with that game plan. So Jim Ross, Jason Perillo, and Dan Seven. It's a big show. I'm excited. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Jason Prill, an absolutely great guy. And guys, if you do enjoy the tidbit out of the Dan Severin interview, um, you could just click on the full interview. It's on the channel and uh, it's youtube.com forward slash submission radio AU. As always, the Twitter is at submission AUS if you have any comments or questions for us. And uh, the website is www.submissionradio.com. Jump on there. A lot of great articles are written by the Submission Radio guys. A lot of um, a lot of the episodes, a lot of the highlights from the show. Um, so if you are looking for a definitive version of Submission Radio, you can jump on there. It's mobile friendly, so you can jump on your mobiles right now and still check it out. But you know, without further ado, because we do have a huge showcast, I think it's time for our first guest. Alright guys, our next guest is one of the best boxing coaches in MMA. He has coached guys such as Michael Bisping, BJ Penn, Chris Cyborg, Tito Ortiz and many others. Uh, guys, he is none other than Jason Perillo. Jason, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you? I'm great, man. How are you? Yeah, fantastic. It's absolutely, it's really good to have you on. Um, now, let's chat about some of your success recently. One of your, one of your pupils had a very successful outing recently at UFC Macau. Michael Bisping put on a clinic against Kung Lee and got a TKO, uh, something we haven't seen from Michael in a while. Tell us about some of the things you worked on with Michael for the camp. Well, yeah, no, yeah, I was real proud of him uh, to, 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 to stay on that. Yeah, he had a, he had a great performance. Um you know what? In, in all reality, I thought that Michael Bisping was going to come out in his last fight with uh, Tim Kennedy. Um, it just didn't show up. I don't know if it was a, a year layoff of rust, you know, and, and, and just kind of coming off some surgeries. I think he might have been a little hesitant. But uh, I really thought that, that uh, Michael Bisping was going to come out in that fight. Um, we had to obviously shake off a little ring, ring rust. And uh, he showed what uh, we've been we've been. Uh, We've been developing his, his stand-up and his boxing game, you know, which obviously it helps with his kicking game, too, because his balance has improved quite a bit over the last couple of years, and uh, which is helping him set, set, set his feet a little bit more and let his hands go a little bit better. So, you know, it, you know in all reality, we, we can start looking for some more finishes, and that's what we've been looking to do. And like I said, you know, uh, we, had, we were scheduled to fight Mark Munoz. That fell out due to surgeries. And, um, you know, he really was developing and setting down better on his punches. And, um, you know, we went in, we, you know, we went through the surgery and the layoff, and then we had that, uh, that, that shitty, that shitty outing against, uh, Colin the French against, um, <laughs> against Tim Caddy, Kennedy rather. And, uh, yeah, no, we, we've been, we've been working on him settling in there and staying in the pocket and let his hands go more. You know, he's got such a high volume of, uh, of arsenals, you know, there's no reason he should be jumping out of there. He should stay in there and then let it fly. And uh, you showcase that obviously in the last week in Macau. Absolutely, Jason. Now, you know, a lot of fans were a little bit worried about Michael after his eye injuries and um, after his Tim Kennedy performance, like you mentioned. I'm just wondering, from a coach's perspective, uh, when Michael did return and after the whole eye uh, saga back to training, how hard was it 
for you guys to get him back, you know, to where he was before he took that long break from MMA? Well, you know, Mike always stays in shape. I mean, he, he still stayed in the gym. He still was, you know, so, you know, other than when he couldn't, you know, other than after surgery when he had to settle in and, and, and let everything heal up. Um, you know, Mike's as hungry as a guy that, you know, is just starting the game. So it's not too hard to get him motivated back in the gym. And, and you know, with Mike, the biggest issue is, is, is pulling back on the reins, you know, uh, as far you know, he wants to. As soon as the doctor says you're clear to spar, Mike's trying to get in there and spar, you know, ten rounds that day. So, you know, with him, it's it, it's putting on the it, it's put on the brakes sometimes with Mike, even though it sounds crazy. But you know, he's a hungry guy, and uh, you know, he believes in himself. So, it wasn't hard to get him going back in the gym. Now, you know, we spent some time. You know, I as a coach on the sidelines, sitting there watching, seeing how he um, was reacting to shots on that side and. You know, he, he, he's seeing a lot, you know, he's seeing everything. He's reacting to everything, you know, so, you know, it, it's not as, as a concern of mine anymore, you know, seeing the way he's performed his last fight and seeing the way he's been performing in the gym. Um, you know, he's, he's really settled in and, and, and he's, he's back on par, you know. Now, Michael's, you know, he's a great fighter, very, very well-rounded, and he's been at the top of the middleweight division for a long time now. One thing that Michael has gotten criticism for, uh, and he seems to be working on it a lot, is power in his punches. As a trainer, how hard is it to add power to somebody's punches, and what are some of the things, uh, or what are some of the ways to do it? Well, in all reality, the, you know, the saying is, you know, you're, you're, you're born with it. You know, you're born, you're born as a puncher, you're not, you know. Um, but now you can develop power. You know, um, Mike um, was so quick to get in and out of there. You know, he he um, he hasn't settled down to where he sits as much as Buck said. You know, I saw him sitting a lot better in his last fight with Kung Lee. You know, he put him in a, in a defensive position. He was able to, you know, plant his feet a little bit more, you know, and, and let him fly. You know, his volume of punches, you know, you know, he throws at such high volume, and now that he's really settling down the pocket, you know, he's able to sit on some of his punches a little bit more, which will, you know, give him give him his, you know, top power. He's a strong guy. I mean, there's no reason, you know, and we get on those hand pads, and, you know, when we sit down and we settle down and he's letting him fly, he's got some leverage on his shots. It's just, you know, really getting him, you know, confident in that pocket so he's able to sit down and let him go so he can use his, his legs also to help drive his shots. But, you know, you know, guys' hands are heavy and they're not. Some guys have terrible technique and they can knock a building down, you know. So, you know, that's as, as a coach, you know, I just try to develop as much power as the guy's got inside him, you know. And, 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 and with that, you know, you got to go to the basic fundamentals of, you know, getting the guy to set down his punches and, 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 and be a lot more balanced so he can shift his weight and leave his shots. Yeah, that's some fascinating stuff there, Jason. And, you know, things between Michael and Luke Rockhold have been heating up for a while now. Um, if the two end up fighting, will you train with Michael for that fight? And how do you see a fight between uh, Luke and Michael going um, in the striking department? Well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I believe Michael has the experience on Luke Rockhold. I've, um, I've caught hand pads for uh, Luke a couple times, and, you know, he's a strong kid. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's an up-and-coming guy, so... You know, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a, all these guys in, the, in, in this in this uh, in this UFC and you know, all these guys, this middleweight's a stacked division. There's a lot of tough guys. You know, any any fight in that top ten, you know, from Luke Rockhold to any of the guys in, in, in that division, the top ten, you know, you know, poses a threat to anybody. Everybody poses a threat to each other. Um, I think Mike um, had more experience. And uh, I think ultimately that's going to come into play big time in that fight, if that, if that fight unfolds. Me personally, I, you know, it, 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 me and Mike talk about it. It's funny that, you know, the number eight, number whatever, to nine, ten guy, you know, are, are, are campaigning against each other, which Mike really I don't think is shooting out at him as much as he's looking to fight Mike. But And I have no problem with the fight. I, I think that's a fight we can win. Um but it's just funny because you're trying to you're trying to work your way down towards the number number three, number two, number one spot, you know, rather than float back and fight each other and then and then you know towards the, the bottom of the uh, the division or the top ten, I should say. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Luke was on our show a, a while back, a few episodes back. You know, he mentioned that the fight sticks out in his mind because, you know, him and Bisping have this this heat between themselves. The fight, you know, would sell really well. But I'm just wondering, you know, this whole thing stemmed from a, you know, a training session that Michael spoke about back in the day between him and Luke where, you know, apparently Michael really had his way with Luke in the ring. I was wondering, we, we, do you know much about that particular sparring session? Were you around well, when that you happened? Know, yeah. Well, ironically enough, I'm the one who set up the sparring session. So, yes, I was there. I, um, you know, when Luke came into uh, to Ruka, where my gym's at, and, you know, he, he's friends with Pat Tenori, the founder of Ruka, which is a clothing company out here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he goes, Luke's in the gym. He goes, can you get in and train with these guys? I said, yeah, no problem. He come down, he can move with Bisbing. You know, and, and he came down to uh came down to spar with Bisbing and they sparred it was one day and they went at it. You know, they went three rounds. So they're wearing MMA I believe uh one was wearing MMA gloves, the other guy was wearing MMA sparring gloves and you know they went at it, you know, and, and Mike was Mike was um I don't really talk about what goes on the gym so much because, you know, that's it. anything happens in the gym, you know, one guy gets the better of one guy one day and the other guy gets the better of the other guy another day. You know. This particular day, I would have, I you know, I would have played in favor of Michael, obviously, but you know, and and, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I coached Mike and I was there. It's just, you know, in fairness to Luke, I don't know, he had to realize he was coming in where Mike was three, four weeks out from the fight, so he was kind of in a in a in a, you know, heavy mode and, and ready to go. You know, I don't know if Luke was, you know, in a, you know, didn't come in there thinking that. What, what level they were at right there. But, you know, they went at it, and, and, and Mike stayed on top. And, uh, you know, you can't really gauge much from it, in all honesty, from the sparring session. You know, it, 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 it was a three-round sparring session, and we went on to another guy. So, as a matter of fact, I think he came in and out. I think we used uh, Rockhold one round, used another guy another round, and Luke, Luke came back in on the third round or whatnot. So, as far as... Uh, who got the better of who? I, I, you know, at the time I, I would have gave Mike uh, on top of the, of the, of the sparring session, um, but again, I'm not, I'm not trying to gauge anything off that. Yeah, that's and that's absolutely understandable. Um, Luke obviously is very confident and likes his chances against Michael so much so that he said it basically uh, challenged him to say that if Michael could survive one round against Luke, Luke's entire purse would belong to Michael, saying that he'll basically knock Bisping out. I would. Is it safe to assume that you would not see that happening? You 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 wouldn't see like assuming that if they took the fight, Michael would be walking out with Luke's purse. I I actually wish that I could be part of the bet because I would take that. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty. I mean, it's a, you know, that's a very. I mean, you know, yeah, you 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 know, you're putting up a lot less. Uh, you know, obviously money wise, you know, there's a there's a huge difference in who's risking what. You know, but at the end of the day. Um, Come on, you know, you know, a lot of people judge Mike Bisbing outside the cage and looking at him from the outside looking in. I think they they get the wrong idea. I think even a guy like Kung Lee was looking at Mike outside the cage and thinking, you know what, I could beat this guy. Then he stood in front of him and realized he was overwhelmed. Mike's one of those one of those guys. You know, you, you know, you're not going to know what you're until you're in front of him. You don't know what you got. You know, you could sit outside and guess and and and. and and say he might be a little lighter in the you know lighter in the punching division in, in the punching area, or, or you can make your judgments on him. Maybe you don't think he's got that good of a wrestler, but I don't see many guys get in that cage and, and, and have their way with Mike. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Jason. You know, yeah, just yeah. sorry, continue. Sorry. No, I'm just thinking for I mean for Luke to think that he can go out and there be you know I would <laughs> like to take that bet you know and I would like to see uh, uh, Mike go right at Luke you know maybe try to take him out in the first round which would shock the hell out of everybody but you know Mike's got that ability he's just got to he's just got to believe in it and this last fight I think was really good for his confidence and uh, mm. he hasn't stopped the guy in a while and I know that's gonna you know it's gonna do him well mentally. And Jason, before we move on in the interview, I just wanted to know, you know, what was the experience like fighting in Macau? Obviously, um, it's not really a place where the UFC goes very often. And uh, were you impressed with the heart that uh, Kung Lee showed in the fight? I mean, his face was just an unbelievable mess. Um, did you did you find a newfound respect for Kung um, after that after that bout? Are you kidding me? I, I had, you know, nothing but, I mean, the guy's a tough guy. I mean, what a tough man. You know, he, he you know, there's a... He, 
he was beat up. I had, you know, it's been a while since I've I seen the guy that bloody, you know, in the cage, you know, been a part of a fight that bloody. Um, he, he was busted up and he definitely showed the heart of a warrior. I mean, you know, you got, I've known Kung Lee for many years. I've known him 15 or so years, you know, and he, he's always been that guy. He's, he's a, he's a true warrior. And, you know, he's a martial artist, like he says, and, you know, he, he, he dug deep and tried to do the best he could. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, you know, and when you add the fact that obviously he's a, he's a guy who's 42 and he does a lot of acting as opposed to training, it's insane to see someone, you know, so so tough, especially up against a guy like, you know, who's elite like Michael. Um, you know, someone else that you also train with is Chris Cyborg, you know, she's one of the few threats that people see to Ronda Rousey's throne. Uh, two of the obstacles at the moment are obviously that she's not in the UFC and she's never made 135 pounds. Um, in your opinion, do you see either of those happening? Do you think we'll eventually see Ronda vs. Cyborg? Well, I don't see why it's not happening. I, I don't want to see it fall into this Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather. I mean, obviously, mm. that's gone on forever. But this Chris Cyborg is the only fight. Not that she's the only fight for Ronda. And I'm sure there's going to be more girls that develop over the years. But, I mean, that's the ultimate fight now, isn't it? I mean... Chris Cyborg and you know she, you know I, I you know I know she had said no to Belcher. I know Belcher is going to be trying to probably get her also, but I mean that's the fight and she's hungry for that fight, and uh, you know she's going to prove that she can make 135 in December. You know that's her, that's a goal right now, and uh, you know she shows that she can make 135. There's no way that fight's not going to happen. I don't see how it can, you know, unless somebody's being fickle, you know, one side or the other. You know, I don't know how that fight's not going to happen. Absolutely. And, you know, Ronda's obviously made some huge leaps and bounds in her skills recently. But, um, you know, if we do take a Ronda Rousey now, even even the dominant one that we saw um, quite recently, and put her up against Chris Cyborg, do you, how do you see the fight playing out? Do you still feel like Chris has an advantage there in the striking department? Well, yeah, I do. You know, and, and I've seen I've seen some footage of Ronda hitting the hand pads and stuff like that. Um you know, she's developing. It looks like she's coming along, you know, and learning learning some, you know, her striking game. Um, but, you know, it's more developed in a fight. You know, you know, unfortunately, she doesn't have the experience that, that um, Chris has as far as standing up and exchanging with, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, lie, in a fight, you know, where we got judges, you got a crowd, you know, and the intensity is a different ball game. you know. Granted, Ronda stepped up on a high level where there's, you know, the high pressure with a, a, a large crowd and, and a lot of attention, you know, paying attention to the fight that she's involved in. She's done, you know, obviously extraordinarily well, but as far as standing up and trading punches and going in there again, going in the pocket and settling, settling in there and, 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 and let your hands go, you know, and your kicks go, um, she, she's behind, you know, she, she's, she's, she's an experience as far as, you know, it, you know, compared to Chris right now, uh, I, I see her having a very difficult time sitting in front of Chris. Yeah, and <laughs> it's absolutely the fight to make. So all, all these questions when we talk about it, it's like, man, why is this fight not happening? So it's definitely going to be good when it does. Now, we wanted to bring something up with you, Jason. And I know you've spoken about this a fair bit, but it's amazing how a lot of fans still don't understand this. You know, you caught a lot of flack uh, after BJ Penn's last fight, even though you had very little to do with the preparation and the strategy of that fight. For those who don't know, tell us a little bit about what exactly was your involvement leading up to BJ Penn's last fight. Well, yeah, um, yeah. Well, thanks for asking me about that. I, I was fortunate enough; a couple of guys, a couple of guys, had called me to interview about that. Um, you know, there was no involvement. You know, I, I unfortunately haven't been working with BJ for you know three, four years by that fight. I, I, I was part of the Nick Diaz fight or camp a little bit, you know, years ago. But um, you know, me and BJ have always been stay tight. Um, he asked me six months prior to that fight that he just had with Frankie. Um, to come do the Ultimate Fighter with him, the Tough Show, and uh, you know, I'm like, ah, I, I was, I, I wanted, I was other things that were a little bit more on my priority list, but you know, he's my man, so I went and did the show with him. And as we're on the show, you know, we were talking about, you know, getting back and, and doing what we used to do, you know, train like we used to train, and that never panned out. Is he started developing that style that you saw? You know, he started developing that, you know, you know, with some guys back in Hilo. And, um, you know, he went with that style. He told me that he didn't want me, and, you know, he'd rather not stress me out with that, what he wanted to do, 
you know, he wanted to focus on this this style that he was developing. He didn't want to stress me out, so he didn't have me come to camp. So I wasn't involved in camp. And um, a week before the fight, he called me up, and you know, I've been in, I've been in so many of his big fights. You know, I've, I've cornered him, and you know, in, in all his in all his title defenses and his last world title at lightweight and stuff. And you know, I was part of those camps. And I was a big part of those camps. But this this fight, I just think he felt comfortable with me coming out. And he, you know, out of all the voices he wanted to hear in the corner was mine. So, you know, I pretty much went out there to, you know, to back him up and work the corner for him, you know, and 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 see if we can, you know, pull him through the fight. You know, we went out there. And obviously, you saw what happened, and um, everybody and their mother, every website, everybody, you know, pointed the finger at me. You know, you know, shame on me for, you know. To, you know, I have my boys back. You know, I, I went in there to have his back, and you know, unfortunately, I got a lot of shit for it. And you know, that's something that I have to deal with. You know, I had to deal with it regardless because you know, I got his back. What are you gonna do? You know, and unfortunately, there's a few guys out there that call me up and ask me what happened, just so I can put my statement out there. And BG himself even went out, you know, on a limb, you know, a month out of the fight, and, and made a statement saying that, you know. You know, he was, he was hoping that people could understand that I, I am. Hello. Hey, Jason, we're back. Thanks for putting up with us. We're all back. Yeah. We're all back together again. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Jason. Yeah, some Hi. issues there, but we're back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly where I let off, left off, but, um, you know, basically I, I, I went out. BJ again asked me, you know, a week prior, you know, a week prior to the fight to go out and, and uh, he wanted me to work his corner. You know, he he had his guys. He had a, a boxing coach that he had been working with for a couple of years out there. You know, prior to the Roy McDonald fight, and uh, prior to this fight, and um, I think he felt that he was a little ex- inexperienced as far as uh, you know talking in the corner. And um, he knows in the past and in, in, in all his big fights and his his, his, his title fight and his title defenses. You know, I was I was a the guy there talking him in the corner, so I I think he felt real comfortable and, and, and felt that uh, he wanted me there in the corner for him. But um, like I said, I I haven't I haven't been in camp with BJ for a few years, and um, you know, we kind of he kind of drifted from the style that we had been working on in the past. And uh, you know, you saw the style that came out. You know, obviously it wasn't effective from what I understand. It was effective in the gym. That's what the guys were telling me. Again, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but um. You know, as far as BJ is concerned, as far as BJ, BJ is my boy. He's my friend. He was my fighter before he was my friend. But you know, over the years, many, many, you know, eight, nine years now, ten years, you know, we developed this, you know, strong friendship. So, you know, I'd always go into battle with him if, if he asked me to work his corner. But unfortunately, you know, I had nothing to do with that camp, and and you know, I took a lot of slack for it. And, and I hate making excuses and telling people, you know, what I had nothing to do with it. But unfortunately, I didn't have anything to do with it. You know, so what are you going to do? Absolutely, Jason. You know, just uh, last question on BJ, and this one is: um, What do you think? Do you think that the move down to featherweight um, to fight Frankie Edgar was the right uh, the right move in hindsight? Um, you know, I know BJ uh, spoke a little bit about the fact that he thinks now maybe it wouldn't it wasn't the right choice. Maybe it was a bit too much weight to cut. What do you think? Do you think that was the right move for BJ going down to featherweight for that one? Well, you know, I think go back down to 155. But, well, well, you know, ultimately me and BJ got back and forth with 155 for years. You know, I mean, some of those fights at 170 that he ended up going to, I, I wasn't a part of those camps either. You know, I don't know if he felt that, you know, I was so strong and adamant about him going to 155. So, you know, again, he didn't want to make me feel uncomfortable with that. But, um, you know, 55 was, I, I know BJ could have come back at 55 and, and proved that he was the best 155 pounder that ever lived. Um, and then BJ being the very unpredictable man that he is, you know, calls me up and says, we're going to 145, you know. And, you know, you, he's, really, he's got, out of all the gray hairs in my beard and my head, man, my, you know, 90% of them came from him, you know. <laughs> he, he is an unpredictable dude, you know. He, he and, you know, he that that was a choice he wanted to make. Um, yeah, I think he would have been smarter. I think it would have been a smarter move to go to 155, especially you know coming off you know his last couple of fights at 170. 
You know, and he hadn't fought in a couple of years. He hasn't been down to 145 in a long time. Um, BJ's not one to use an IV bag. So, you know, the, the way guys hydrate, you know, or dehydrate, you know, they really suck a lot of water out of themselves. You know, it's, it, it, you know, near impossible for some of these guys to, to completely dehydrate themselves, you know, without those IV bags. So, you know, it, it, it was a gamble that he made, you know, and it, it didn't go his way. And it didn't go our way, I should say. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I would have loved to see him on 135 rather than 145. And I would have liked to see, and I and I said this in my past, in an in interview in the past, um, I want to see BJ still come out after a two-year layoff and fight a top 20 guy, not a top two guy. You know, like, not only is he going down to 145, the weight class that he's never fought before, but, you know, I come from the game of boxing, and boxing, when, you know, an ex-champ comes out of retirement or whatnot, after a two-year layoff, he certainly doesn't, you know, start start campaigning his run towards the title again with the number two guy or the number one guy. He doesn't do that. You know, you got to, you know, I talked about Ring Russ earlier in this interview with Michael Bisming and his, you know, year layoff, you know, before that Kennedy fight. And and I believe in Ring Russ, you know. I, you know, I, when I fought with nothing but Ring Russ. When I fought, I fought so far and few between. You know, I was rusty every time I got in there. But, you know, there's some truth to us. And and a guy that you know, a guy like Frankie Edgar, who's you know even sees himself even more over the two years that BJ's been off, you know, it, it's not you know it's not the best. That's not only 145, but going in there against a the top two guy. Let's shake out the rust. We went in there against a the top, you know, top 20 guy, top 15 guy, even you know went in there and, 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 and you know. In you know, a little less threatening situation, not to where we're a ten to one underdog. I think at one point, you know, BJ was a ten to one underdog. Wow. You know, he he needed to know where he was at at one forty five first before you go up against a guy that's beat you twice. You know, when you haven't fought in a couple of years. You know, that's my biggest. You know, my biggest excuse, if you want to put it, or or whatnot. But the way I look at outside in, you know, if. If I was, you know, in charge of BJ's management or whatnot, or if I was, you know, had to add a call or the promoter, if I can make the choice of who would be fighting coming off that long of a layoff, coming back down and away, it wouldn't have been the top two guy, even if it wasn't Frankie Edgar, whoever it was. I mean, it's, you know, the guys, the guys are in the top five for a reason, you know, and, and you want, you've got to see if you're, you're close to that yet, you know, after a long layoff. I'm sorry to ramble on about it. It's just, you know, I'm passionate about it, and, and you know, and I see it that way. That's the way I see it. No, you know, we we absolutely appreciate it. You know, we love when guests come on and they're very honest. It's a lot better than, like, a one- or two-word answer. And honestly, what you just said makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of fans will, will agree. I um, mean, you know, I think I think when the fight got announced, it was BJ vs. Frankie. It was kind of crazy because Frankie was so, you know, he was very dominant and he was very active, whereas BJ wasn't so. So I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, also, wanted to pick your brain just on some techniques in general, Jason. You know, we hear always uh, people talking about the importance of the jab. You know, some of the BJ had as well. How how you know, and how it, you know it's yet to truly become a staple in MMA like it is in boxing. Can you explain to us, you know, for all the fans that may not understand, all the listeners, the importance of the jab and why it's such a crucial technique? Well, I mean, you can win a whole fight with a jab. You know, jab a jab is a a jab is an offensive defensive. A range finder, rhythm maker, it's everything. You know, if you know how to use it, you got to be educated on it. You know, the thing is, is a lot of guys, um, you know, the, you know, unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, this is mixed martial arts, but, you know, some guys fall. There's not enough time of the day sometimes, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I mean, guys, boxing is something that's got to be developed, you know, and that's what I was talking about with Michael earlier. You know, Mike's always had a good jab at he, he, he does have a, a good stand up style. I think we developed and added even more inches to his game. You know, in, in that jab, you know, is, is even getting, you know, you saw the way that jab does it up Kung Lee. You know, he set down on it better. But the jab is, is, a, is a valuable punch. It really is. I mean, especially for me, it's funny, man, because everybody, you know, wants to train so many different styles and so many different things and, and, and Muay Thai and, and all of it. I think everybody should train. You got to get the, you got to get, uh, you know, the experience with, uh, with with all the all the game. You know, the kicks, the punches, the knees, the elbows, the wrestling, the, the jiu-jitsu. But you know, if, if you really looked at a at an MMA fight, you know, or you know, any fight really, 
the, the amount of punches thrown compared to everything else, you know, the, the category of punches compared to kicks thrown in a fight is just night and day, you know, so as far as people developing their punches, I, I don't, I, for me as a boxing coach, I wonder why more people don't want to try to take it a little bit more serious, but as far as the jab's concerned, you know, you could dictate a whole fight with a jab. You know, you should be able to keep a guy off balance with a jab. You should be able to defend yourself with a jab, block punches with a jab, you know, bust a guy up with a jab. You know, jab's a very valuable punch. It's just, it, it's not the most exciting punch in the game. You know, I think so, you know, a lot of people steer away from it. And, you know, if you don't understand how to use it, you know, some guys get hit throwing the jab, so they shy away from it. But again, it's something that's got to be developed. You got to learn how to step into the pocket with a jab hide behind your shoulder and be able to, you know, be able to, you know, use it, you know, and then you got to obviously throw it many, many times and, and be directed on how to, how to, how to sharpen up your body mechanics with it. Absolutely, Jason. And we have some fan questions for you, but before we jump to them, one last question about um, this crazy world of MMA and boxing. You know, people talk a lot about boxers transitioning to MMA and how MMA boxing is different to boxing. As a coach, can you tell us about that and why some of the techniques in boxing, in your opinion, may not work for MMA or maybe they would, but people just aren't using them? Well, it's just stance, a lot of it. You know, a lot of it is stance. I mean, you, you can look at a boxer, you know, a box, the, the range of a of a MMA fight and the range of a of a of a boxing fight, and we're talking two three feet of difference. You know, what I mean, you're not standing in front of each other the same way. I mean, a boxing fight is predominantly in the pocket. You know, you come in and out of the pocket a little bit. You know, the higher level of boxers, the closer you're in there. You know, you get these four round fighters and they're a little distance apart. You get the six rounders, they come a little closer. The eight rounders, they come a little closer than that. Then you get the ten and twelve rounders and they're up in the pocket and they're fighting. You know what I mean? Um, so as far as the stance is concerned, you're, you, you know, angles are a little bit more important, you know, in a boxing match when you're in as far as, you know, you know, turning your shoulders and, you know, maybe putting yourself in position, you know, as far as the MMA, you put yourself in, in some of those positions of boxing, you're vulnerable to takedowns or knees or kicks or whatnot. So, um, but a good fighter, if, if you develop a proper, you know, good fundamentals and you're with a coach that, you know, understands potty mechanics, you know, and, and, and kind of can see a bigger picture of the thing, then you should be able to develop a real strong boxing style and adapt that to your MMA game. You know, be able to still check your kicks, still be able to, you know, set when, when it's time to set and, you know, go a little bit higher on the hips when it's time to, to walk around a little bit, you know what I mean. I don't know if I'm making a whole lot of sense, but you know that you know, you know so some of the boxing stance, you know, people feel that you know they put themselves in a vulnerable spot mm -hmm. when you're setting down or the way you're angling. But in all reality, if you if you know how to use it, you should be able to know how to use it in the right at the right times and the right distances. Yeah, no, absolutely. It definitely makes sense, Jason. Now, um, we've got a few fan questions as well. We told everyone you were coming on the show, and they threw in their questions. Uh, so we'll kick it off. Adam Shaw, and he's on Twitter, at Shawkey123. Uh, he wants to know, who has the hardest punch that you've trained? Oh, hardest punch that I've trained. That's an interesting question because, you know, everybody punches a little different. Some guys punch heavier. Some people punch harder. You know, some people got, you know, so, you know, the leverage is all different, you know. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've trained some pretty, uh, I've trained some boxers, too, that had some heavy punches. I'm trying to think. Let me see. I, I want to give you a good answer. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I've had everybody on the hand pads. I've had from Jose Aldo to, to, to Anderson Silva to, to, you know, the Bisbings, the Titos, all those guys. Um, it's in MMA, you want the I'll give you the answer for MMA. Yeah, yeah. Who's the hardest guy? And I don't want to do that because everybody that everybody <laughs> everybody that trained are like hey, you, you got to get me. some phone calls after hey, this. Me. Like Jason, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You, you know boy. what? I, I, I don't want to. It, it's Adam, right? I don't want to. I don't want to bum Adam out. But you know, I can't give you the. I can't give you a real honest answer. We got a lot of. There was a lot of different forms of punching. You know, a guy that. I can go up. I got a kid that I put in there, and he's part against uh, a lot of the high-level MMA guys that I work. And I think he was hitting the hardest by, I would say, Vitor Belfort. Vitor in his straight left hand definitely definitely has some serious leverage on it. Wow. But, um, 
But, um, yeah, you know, it's hard <laughs> to say. Cause every, you know, there's, like I said, there's different, there's different, some guys got heavy, 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 heavy hands, but they don't know how to use, they don't know how to put it. They don't know how to set a guy up to put him out of there. Mm. You know what I mean? There was a guy, there's a guy by the name of, you know, you know, people might look him up. There's a guy by the name of Aaron Brink. I used to train many years ago. He ended up being a porn star. The guy was a mess. But at the end of the day, that guy, that guy would hit, that guy would knock a building down with his right hand. He hit like a ton of bricks and he hit so hard. He stands out in my, my brain that I even mentioned him, you know what I mean? Because he doesn't even come to mind. But every time I think about a hard hitter, that guy had some serious leverage. And he fought, he fought a lot of guys, but he was a 50, 50 guy, maybe 15 and 15 type of guy. And, and like I said, you know, that, that you know, that goes to show you, here's a guy that stands out in my head with real heavy hands, but didn't do anything with them. Mm. You know what I mean? So, but you know, they're all heavy. BJ's got a heavy punch, you know, Vitor's got a heavy punch. Um, you know, but, I know people don't want to believe it, but when, when Mike wants to set down a punch, he can whack, you know, but I got to give credit to everybody I trained having heavy. Chris Cyborg can crack for a girl. I'll tell you that much. She's got some, <laughs> she's got some heavy hands, but I, I fortunately, everybody that I, I see, see I, I'm a, I'm 150 pounds. So everybody seems like they're hitting harder than me when they're hitting me in the hands for God's sake. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'll, 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 I'll go. I'll, I'll run this. I'll run this question into a circle because I, I don't want to. I don't want to discredit <laughs> anybody. You know what I mean? We, we yeah. don't want to hurt his feelings. Adam. We understand. <laughs> um, now, next question comes from the Nighthawk Twenty Three. He'd like to know what your thoughts are on striking in WMMA women's MMA. Um, he says that he feels like there's not much head movement, not many combinations, a lot of wild swings, and can be difficult to watch at times when certain female athletes are competing. Um, what are your thoughts on the development of striking in women's MMA? Well, you know what I think makes it tough is, you know, it's one thing, like I talked about Rhonda earlier as far as, like, you know, competing with stand-up, you know, being in a long, drawn-out fight, standing up, which will give her the, the experience that she obviously needs. Mm -hmm. Um but these girls in the gyms, they don't have, you know, each other to, to compete against in the gym to help develop that sparring. You know, I mean, we can hit the hand pads. We can hit the heavy bags. We can, you know, we can, you know, do all this, kick the tie pads. I mean, we can do all this stuff, but ultimately we got to go get in that firing line in order to develop, you know. And these girls spend a lot of time sparring guys. You know, they, they spend a lot of time in there with guys. And, and, and they never really get developed because guys are taking it easy or, you know, you know, it, it becomes more of a game and, and there's not a, there's not that intensity. That intensity is what brings the best out of people, which helps people get to another level, you know, and these girls don't get the same intensity in the gym with each other because they're all spread out. You know, I, I've, I've worked a few, you know, trains, Chris Cyborg and also, um, Jessica Penny, which was a, a, an ex Adam weight champion. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I've been in the gym with those girls for years and you know, it's, it's hard to get other girls to work with each other. You know what I mean? It's hard to get, but they're spread out. And, and, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, 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 I've gone to a couple of those, um, Invicta fights and, and like people say, you know, it, they, you know, they're a little wild, you know, and, and, and they're, you know, the, the women's MMA is a little bit behind, obviously, the M M men's MMA. Um, but, you know, as far as the development process, I think it is, it's failing a little bit in the gyms because you don't have a lot of girls, you know, to help push each other and take it to a, a, a different level in the gym so you can start working on, uh, on on proper fundamentals to help with the head movement and to help with, you know, shifting the weight and, and, and tighten, up, tighten up the arsenal, you know. Yeah, the, you know what? A lot of what you just said makes a lot of sense. Um, we've got another fan question, uh, Jason. The fight is wrap uh, on Twitter at Amber Leroy wants to know what are your favorite hand wraps. So he said it, Leroy, right there, bro. Leroy, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Now, uh, Jason, Seriously, those are the, those are my favorite right there. Was it was it the real Leroy? Tell him to send me a box. <laughs> <laughs> there you no, go, but, Leroy. You you got the plug. Yeah. You got to send Jason some wraps now. Now, Jason, yeah. we're going to play a little game here. It's called the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. What it is is we throw a bunch of uh, silly questions at you and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind, like a word association. So are you ready? Oh, fuck. Are you ready? I don't know, what the, I, I don't know what's going to come out of my fucking mouth, for God's sake. 
Okay, uh, well, right. Those are the best rounds. That's all right. <laughs> okay, here we go. Now, we know you're a great striker. However, how is Jason Perillo's grappling game? Weak. Weak? <laughs> all right. Now, have you ever had anybody try and book you thinking that you were Jason Derulo? All day long. <laughs> you had an impressive 8-0 and zero record in boxing. Uh, what was the injury that forced you to retire as a fighter? The catch right now. Wow. When fighters are trying to make weight, do you try and eat healthy around them, or are you smashing burgers on the daily? Well, I try to eat healthy. I, try, I don't eat much, so I, I can't give you one one word answer, but you know, I, I try to stay what I I try to just, just drink beer around my fighters, not eat so much. This is going to be a hard one for you, but who's the best boxer in MMA right now? Oh. <laughs> and you can't you can't go in a circle ah. now because it's a one word answer. <laughs> oh, oh, you sons of tap out! I'm tapping out. It's a tap out question. Um, I like. I'm gonna say Vitor Belfort again, but you know what? Can I give you two, please? Yeah. Okay. Two. All right. All right, Jason. I'll give you two. You know what? I'm gonna go. Since since I, only because I I haven't seen Nick in fight in a couple of years. I'm going to go with uh, Vitor. I'm going to go with Robbie Lawler, too. I like Robbie Lawler. Ooh. I like the way Robbie Lawler boxes. He's a puncher. He's not much of a boxer, but I like the way he puts them together. Yeah, we, we love the way Robbie punches as well. Now, uh, Jason, finish the sentence. People don't know that I. I'm happy. All right. <laughs> they don't know I'm happy. They think that you're upset most of the time, Jason. They think I'm upset all the time. <laughs> um, Diaz, Nick Diaz versus Anderson Silva. You know, you prepared BJ for Diaz before. Who do you think wins in that one? Um, I think uh, I think Anderson's a little too long and lanky for him. Okay. I th- I'm going I'm to give it to Anderson. Okay. Now, Jason, what is the best boxing movie uh, that there ever was? Are you kidding me? What kind of question is that? I mean, come on. Rocky, man. All right. <laughs> well, I was, I was watching UFC Macau over the weekend, and I thought I was watching Rocky near the end there when I was looking at Kung's face. So it's, it's, it was a great yeah, homage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's the secret to holding mitts? Because when, when you hold mitts, I don't think there's anyone like you in MMA that holds mitts because you have a very intense look on your face. And I think when you hold mitts, that's like people can film that and show that in countdowns all day long because it looks intense and awesome. So what's the secret to it? I've been holding the, I, I've been holding the mitts for about, about 22 years now. I've held them for world. I, I, it's experience really. I mean, I, I'll tell you this and I don't mean to be long winded on it, but when I started, I, I, when I boxed as a kid, for the time I boxed as a kid, I held hand pads for, for, for guys. That's how I made a living when I was younger. I, I started doing this, fitness shit back when I was a kid for boxing and um it's experience I held the mitts exactly how I wanted to hit them I wanted the guy in front of me the guy that was holding the mitts I wanted him to hold them the way I hold them and I developed a style holding my mitts for for many many years and um and I and I and I'm passionate about it you know I got three elbow surgeries to prove it you know I, I, something that you know something that I try to develop I developed a, a, a game with my hand pad the same as I did when I fought myself. Wow. Now, Jason, you know, in those many years, uh, what's the strangest experience at a boxing or MMA event you've had as a trainer? Oh, strangest, huh? Mm. I did. I yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've had I've had some strange ones, but I mean, I as far as uh, as far as what strangest experience I've had as a, as a, as a boxing trainer. You know what? They're all pretty, so you, you, when you deal with fighters, I mean, nothing really shocks me anymore. So I can't even, I couldn't even like really muster one up to the top of my brain here because uh, there's nothing that, sh- I, we, you know, we've, we've, I've had strange losses. I've had tr- strange experiences. I've, tr- but there's been so many strange, strange things. I, I couldn't give you an answer on that. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be, coy about it i just don't really have an answer to give you for as far as strange it's all you know it, it all ends up being strange one way or the other stranger <laughs> is strange is strange but yeah. no yeah i don't have an i don't have an answer for i'm sorry man i 
Well, give me an example answer, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll see if I can compare with that one. How about something, for example, um, in the back before a fight, it was weird or a strange, um, you know, a strange promotion, and you're in the back and you see something strange or after the fight we'll or some kind of an, weird we'll, fan interaction. Or we'll give you an I'll, give, I'll, 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 I'll give you, I'll give you one for my own, my own fight experience. Why yeah. fought? Can I give you something like that? Yeah, of course. Yes. There we'll you take go. It, my all experience. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm fighting in this, this club fight down in uh, it was either Chicago or Indianapolis, something like that. It was a it was a shitty little show. They every fighter was sharing the same locker room. I sat I was sitting in the locker room and, and, and I got a I got my opponent who was about fifteen, twenty yards away from me and he's sitting there mad dogging me for about <laughs> uh, the entire time. We're in there for an hour and a half. The guy will stop take a look at it. He's all tatted up. He's got a, a white pride tatoo on his neck. Uh. And <laughs> This white guy, and he had this real strange look to him the whole time. He's looking, I'm going, and 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 he's he's mind fucking me a little bit. In all honesty, I'm going, Jesus <laughs> Christ, dude, what is up with this guy's fucking out of his mind? <laughs> and I'm talking to my coach, and I'm sitting there looking at my coach. And I say, dude, what is up with this guy, Jess? This guy won't stop looking at me, man. He won't stop mad dogging me. I'm like, what's going on, Jess? He senses my my you know my nerves are coming up the surface a little bit. He goes, Hey, Jay. The only thing this guy's doing is he's waking up the lion. And I just go, oh, fuck. And I just started laughing my ass off. And it turned my, it put, it put my head in a whole different fucking, it put my, and that's what a good coach does. You know, anybody can train a guy. Anybody can be a trainer. Anybody can count reps. Anybody can count punches. Anybody can hold the hand pads. But a coach knows how to jump in your subconscious real quick and fucking flip the script. Mm. Wow. And yet. You know, finally, Jason, if you had to pick one uh, career highlight out of your uh, career as a trainer, and I know there's been so many highlights. You've had so many great moments. And again, uh, there's a possibility here where we'll have to go around in a circle. But <laughs> if you had to pick one um, a career highlight for you that really stands out in your mind um, thus far, what would it be? Oh, it's unfair, man. It's unfair. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I, I, I got to. I got some some ties here. <laughs> I got some ties here, but you know, I obviously, you know, not only winning the title with BJ, but defending it against Sean Shirk was a really big deal at mm. the time. It was, it, it, it still, I think, you know, profile is one of the, you know, the the biggest lightweight fights in, in UFC history. I mean, it, at the time, Sean Shirk was a killer, you know, and he was pretty threatening, and and we felt like we were going up there and our, and our backs were against the wall on that one. Um, you know that that fight really stood out, and I will. And, and I spent five months with BJ on that fight, and, and he really went out and boxed uh, Sean Shirk's ears off. So I was real proud of that fight. But you know, also, and you know, is the UFC's not 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 the UFC's favorite guy, but that fight with Ryan Bader when Tito beat Ryan Bader, uh, there was nothing like it, man. It was it was definitely you know, it was, it was the first time I became part of Tito's camp and. You know, he he was he was down on his luck, and he was in a bad place, you know, on that fight, and and we were and we had a real positive camp, and um, it showed up that night, and, it, and and the electricity in the room was amazing. Yeah, I remember, I remember watching that fight. It was absolutely sick, Jason. It's been absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for doing the interview, guys. With you, um, guys, if you want to check out uh, Jason's website, check it out. It's a PerilloBoxing.com. Hit him up. The man holds pads and uh, trains like no one other. Now, Jason, can is there a Twitter account? Can we follow you on Twitter at all? Yeah, you know, I don't go on it. I'm more Instagram guy. You know, Perello Boxing on you know on Instagram, and uh, I got a Twitter account at Perello. It's all Perello. Everything's tied into Perello Boxing. So, you know, maybe at some point I'll I'll, I'll pick up and start twittering there. But you know, I I I, I don't do. I, I try to keep it one or two social medias. You know, it overwhelms me a little bit too much. Well, I was going to say, we jumped on the Twitter page expecting, uh, you know, great content. And I think there was one tweet, no no display. Yeah, you know, somebody even made me that site a while ago. I'll, I'll go, for you guys, I'll go on there and see if I can uh, polish it up a little bit. But <laughs> um, I'll see what I can do. Nice. Awesome. Again, Jason, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Hey, guys, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.
Jason Perillo, what a great guy. Make sure you guys check out his website. And, you know, I think one of the underrated uh, coaches in MMA cast, someone that doesn't get very much uh, credit for his great work and excited to see what he does with Michael Bisping in the future. And now going from someone that works with legend to a bona fide legend in, a, in his own right, cast, we've got a big guest coming up next. Yeah, we absolutely do, guys. We caught up with Dan Seven the other day, and uh, we had to do a pre-record, unfortunately, because uh, Dan Seven is a really busy guy. And in this case, Dan Seven likes to get into things he likes to talk in very great detail about a whole bunch of things you know early ufc's peds um you know where the sport is going who his favorite fighters are nowadays just a whole lot of stuff now uh the interview itself is quite a while and we we didn't have the chance to fit it in on this show because we do have limited time so check it out it's on a youtube channel now submission radio oh sorry youtube.com slash submission radio au uh, feel free to subscribe. It's on there right now. But here's a little tidbit. Here's a little taste of some of the things that Dan had to say. Yeah, I, I definitely would think that you're in a league of your own, Dan. And you mentioned, you know, the, the drug side of MMA and things like that. Like you said, in the beginning of your career when you fought in the UFC, drug testing just wasn't a big part of the sport at all. You know, now it's becoming a massive part. What do you think about the movement to clean up the sport? And do you think PEDs will ever be removed from MMA? You know, I, I don't know about that. It's, uh, I, I think yeah, if you want it to be on a level playing field, the rules have got to be cut and dry all the way across. Um, there, I mean, when you look at bodybuilding, for example, there's an amateur side and then there's a pro side. The amateur side, these guys look like 98-pound weaklings compared to the pros mm -hmm. because these pros, they are putting so much chemicals into their body. I mean, they got arms that look, look like gorilla arms. They got legs that look, look like the hind quarters of a horse. I mean, they're just, you know, you can, today, I mean, if you want to say you want to make Frankenstein, you really could make Frankenstein. You could take a mm -hmm. seven foot tall basketball frame of a body and put them on the right chemicals and put them through the right type of training. You could buy, you could, you could build a freakosaurus that, that weighs probably three to 400 pounds and will destroy anything that, that climbs into the cage with it. But did it win on its own ability? No. And, I, and I, as I said before, I take a great deal of pride in what I've done. I'm, I'm also, a lot of people don't realize, I actually have a teaching degree from Arizona State University. And I have coached at both Arizona State, Michigan State, the Michigan Wrestling Club. I've, I've been... I've been teaching the sport of wrestling since 1971. And I just jumped into teaching professional wrestling when I got involved with that in 1992 because there was no set rules or uh, how to conduct things. And it just all depends on what part of the country you, you, you were. They did things like this. They did things like that. My greatest gift there, guys, is physical mechanics. I sure wish it was something else like singing or dancing because I've been on like America's Got Talent or, you know, we've been doing something else and would have had a whole different type of career ahead of me. But my, my gift is physical mechanics. And I'm the guy that can build you a better widget if there's a better widget to be made. Now, the next question, Dan, is, you know, we all know that you and Don Fry are good friends and, you know, you helped him get into the UFC. But in all honesty, mustache versus mustache, you know, who wins the mustache battle off? I will have to bow to Don. His, his mustache is, it's, it's younger. It's bolder than what mine is. And, and when you throw on that cowboy hat along the, with it and you hear the gravel that comes from that man's voice, obviously I, don't, I have to tap out to Don Fry. <laughs> now, Dan, out of your 101 wins, the first name that pops into your mind is the greatest uh, competition in MMA that you had against a guy. Well, there, there wouldn't be, the, for, for me, it wouldn't be one person, but uh, the, the greatest event that I took part of was the, uh, the first and the only ultimate, ultimate, where they brought back either champions and or runner-ups. It was the first time that you knew who your opponent was for your first match. You didn't know who would be number two or number three because it was still during the eight-man, no holds barred era. And out of a two-hour pay-per-view, I was inside the octagon cage just over one hour between my three opponents. That was the second training camp I ever did in my life. So that's, uh, that was my 
my greatest, uh, I think my greatest point of my career because that was in Denver, Colorado, mile high elevation as well. So as I told pe- as I tell people even to this day, I said at that point in time, my cardiovascular was off the hook. It's off the hook again, but not in a good way. And Dan, finally, out of these people, we want you to choose who you think should grow a mustache a- a- ASAP. Now, uh, the, the four options are Dana White, Brock Lesnar, GSP, Fedor Emelianenko. Who do you choose, Dan? Boy, I'd say out of the only because it probably gets a lot more visibility. I would say that uh, Dana White, if he was to grow a mustache, because you know he's he's on all types of uh, uh, Twitter and, and things of that nature. I think he would get the exposure. TJ Dillashaw, Don, I just want to say thanks to Mission Radio for having me on. It's been a good time. I can't wait to come back and do it again. Our next guest is one of the most iconic commentators in sports entertainment. He has made an undeniable mark on the lives of millions of children, teenagers, and adults around the world at one time or another. We have all attempted to recreate one of his incredible moments in the booth. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to announce that we have good old JR, Jim Ross on Submission Radio. Jim, welcome to Submission Radio. Thank you very much. Glad to be with you guys. Well, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Now, Jim, let's jump straight into it. You know, last weekend we saw you octagon side at UFC Tulsa. Um, tell us a little bit, how did you end up at that particular event? Well, you know, uh, Tulsa is only 100 miles from uh, where I live in Norman. And uh, my two daughters live in Tulsa, so I have family there. And then a lot of my buddies uh, from the USC had contacted me and said, well, are we going to see you at the event? And, and so uh, uh, I just, it was just a leisurely drive over. And uh, and I enjoyed uh the the night was fun and and it was a it was a good easy trip you know no airplane rides uh, and <laughs> in my lifetime no airplane rides is a good thing yeah of course well obviously everybody knows about the crazy travel schedule for the WWE and you were the voice of Monday nights for a long time uh, you know WWE is obviously entertainment much like the UFC but they're different how long have you been a fan of mixed martial arts for I would go all the way back to the uh, beginning of USC when they would have those their one night tournaments. Uh, Hoist Gracie and uh, gosh, they had you know so many different guys. I remember the a big guy named Emmanuel Yarborough. Yeah, was yep. just a you know, huge, no weight limits. It was very coarse, uh, coarsely organized. But from the beginning of the uh, Ultimate Fighting uh, competition, I've been intrigued. And so I started watching long before uh, Zufa bought it and have been a fan ever since. And, you know, Jim, back when it first came out, it was very, very popular. A lot of fans don't realize that UFC 1 and 2, you know, they were quite popular events. I was just wondering, um, from the perspective, you know, of being a part of the WWE, when you guys first saw that this event's coming out, looks a little bit like Street Fighter, what did you guys think of it? Did you think that it would be much of a success when you first saw the concept? Well, you know, I can't speak for everybody in WWE. I know there were a lot of fans that I worked with, a lot of my peers I worked with that enjoyed uh, watching the fights. Shane McMahon was one of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, But there were a lot of us there that were sports fans. And, uh, and I just looked at it as it was a, uh, a new sport brought back to life and, and uh, made available on television. And that's where the heartbeat is of uh, that, that business. Uh, as much as many of us love radio, uh, the USC would uh, obviously not be quite as popular if they uh, were broadcasting strictly on radio and not on television. So uh, a, a lot of us liked it because we were sports fans. You know, I, I like boxing when boxing was, uh, was really relevant back in its day. I'm still a big boxing fan. It's just the fact that boxing right now is not at a is is not a at a peak, unless you're talking about Floyd Mayweather. Mm. Uh, but boxing in itself is still in a rebuilding stage. They got to make new stars. And that's what everybody's business is always about: uh, is making stars. So I think that uh, we were. I don't think anybody was overly concerned about it, uh, yay or nay, really, to be honest uh, about it, and. Any entity that sells tickets, any entity that has pay-per-view has to be considered as a competition to some level. So uh, 
it was just another event that, you know, we just need to f stay focused on what we were doing, and and everything would, you know, it take kind of takes care of itself. So, I think that's where we were. You know, people were intrigued, but nobody knew it was going to grow to the extent that it has under the leadership of uh, Dana White and company. Mm. And uh, when they first started, it did seem kind of like a one-time thing. But, Jim, you mentioned stars. I wanted to talk to you about that. In UFC in Tulsa, they didn't feature really huge names, or at least not too many of them, but it did feature a lot of up-and-comers. Uh, you know, in the WWE, you had a big role in talent relations and dealt with a lot of young stars. Who's somebody that you saw at UFC Tulsa that you think could possibly be a big star in the future? Well, uh, you know, I, I still like uh, Benson Henderson. I think he's... Uh... Uh, an excellent fighter. I, I thought there might have been a little quick stoppage in that fight, but it's certainly arguable. I would err on the side of uh, I would err on the side of caution, obviously, uh, than rather let it go. I thought John McCarthy's decision was a little premature, but not enough to uh, be up in arms about it. So mm. uh, Henderson is a is a is an excellent fighter. Uh, the fellow that he faced. Uh, was kind of came out of you know I wasn't as familiar with him as I was Benson, mm. uh, but uh, they they're 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 doing a nice job there. Joe Silva and uh, the, his group that make the matches I think are doing a pretty good job of of uh, building their roster, and that's where that's where that's the issue. That's where your success or failure is going to come in. You've got to have a uh, an ample list of attractions. Mm. Attraction sell. Uh, the fights. Uh, the the thing about going to Tulsa, I don't know that UFC had ever played Tulsa in its history. So the uniqueness of going to the big building in downtown Tulsa uh, was unique with the, with the UFC in town. They did about 7,000 people, and that was a good uh, crowd for uh, uh, the last weekend before school starts. You know, families are on vacations, and they're at their lake homes and all this other stuff. So I thought they did the, had a nice uh, crowd. 7,000 on, on that night is, is good. Uh, the lower bowl was very full. The ringside was full. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of think that they, they didn't have to really overbook it to get a crowd there. The, the, that was one of those indi indications where the fight night brand and the USC brand is enough to sell. Now, the next time they come to Tulsa, they're going to have to have more star power. Because the new now is gone, the little the, the bloom is off the rose. So now when you come back, if they do, they'll need to bring some more uh, ammunition with them. Absolutely, Jim. Now we're talking about stars, and you know, um, speaking of stars, the UFC has lost some big ones recently. You know, GSP left, Brock's back in the WWE, Anderson has missed an entire an entire year. You know, companies um, always need stars to carry. UFC always needs stars to car carry the company. There's so many shows now. Um, you know, the WWE has the Rocks, uh, had the Rocks, Stone Cold, Hogan, Triple H. And, you know, just what you mentioned about Tulsa, um, they came down to Sydney in 2010, packed out the card, and the place was full, I believe, is one of the fastest selling events. However, on their return, as they couldn't uh, stack the card as much, you know, you could uh, visibly notice there were quite a few, you know, vacancies in the arena. I'm just wondering, um, how can a company like, because obviously with the WWE, it's a little bit different in building stars, but how can a company like the UFC go about, you know, developing young talent and building stars, um, you know, in a sport like MMA, in your opinion? And also, who do you think are some of the biggest stars in the UFC at the moment? Well, you, you, they don't, you can't uh, be successful without attractions. And that goes for uh, a football team, uh, goes for rugby team, uh, Australian rules football. Uh, you want you like the people that like the game like the game, but they like it better when their team is winning, and they like it better when their team has stars. So the bottom line is always: Do I have enough stars in my in my attraction on my team or on this card or on my roster, whatever it may be, uh, to appeal to the fans who are basically customers or consumers. So I think that. Uh, the thing that USC has to do is they have to utilize all the airtime they have on their on their various television shows, and maybe spend time on each show uh, focusing on some of their young talent that they feel good about, and not spend the majority of the time from just promoting the next uh, big fight. USC might be uh, 
might be wise in devoting some time on all of their non-live event shows that they air, and they air a lot of them here in the States, it seems like, with the Fox, relationship with Fox, and I always have something on there that uh, lets me get to know one of their young fighters a little better. I have to make an emotional investment in the fighters, and I need to know more about them. I need to know why I should be excited about watching this individual fight, uh, why I want this individual to win, or why I don't happen to like this individual uh, for whatever reason. But you've got to let me know who these people are uh, in, in more depth. I think that's very important. And, you know, they, uh, George St. Pierre was in Tulsa. He was working the corner of one of his guys, mm. uh, you know, high-dollar corner man. But, but he looked good. He wasn't limping. He looked <laughs> in pretty good shape. Uh, so, you know, you know that GSP will be back. That, that to me, is a no-brainer. Uh, you know, Cain uh, Velasquez is intriguing. Another guy coming off injuries. Uh, the John Jones, uh, John Jones, big star, uh, DC, Daniel Cromier, big star. But, and if, if DC can beat the uh, bones in January, then you've got a, you, you built yourself a, a even bigger star because it's not going to kill, uh, bones Jones if he loses. I'm not saying he's going to lose, but I'm just saying that, uh, if he does lose, uh, you know, it's just a matter of paying to see him, uh, rebound. Uh, so you know, there's, they have they have some stars, but they 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 can always use more. They'll never have too many. Injuries are always an issue. It concerns me that guys sometimes seemingly overtrain. You wonder why so many injuries happen during training camp. I understand somebody will say, "Well, Jr. It's not WWE. You know, this this is not uh, showbiz." Mm -hmm. Well, you know, contrary to that uh, ignorant remark uh, that I just made. Uh, a lot of guys in wrestling get hurt for real. Mm, the yeah, outcomes yeah. are predetermined, but they do get hurt. They do make contact. They do work 200-something days a year. That's the longest season in the world. There's very there's no official off-season. So uh, the you wonder about the training of those guys. And another thing that concerns me about the USC is their uh, policies on uh, cutting weight. Uh, I think that needs to be taken into consideration because then – if that didn't happen, you have a, your roster and your your lineup has a whole different look to it. So they got some real, USC's got some really young, some great stars, and quite arguably their biggest star is Ronda Rousey. Uh, anytime I'm around people that want to talk USC, uh, friends, buddies of mine, uh, football fans, whatever that I see at games, and they talk about USC or MMA in general, she's always in the conversation. So it's hard to say that USC has a bigger star than Ronda Rousey right now, and, and I don't perceive that to be a bad thing. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with you, Jim. One thing you just mentioned there that piqued my interest was uh, about the weight cutting. Uh, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Were you saying that you, the UFC should change something about that? I think that the, 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 the uh, camps, uh, the fighters, Everybody involved in the in the scenario should really evaluate the weight cutting, and not put it into a dangerous, uh, physically dangerous area. When you see guys that are cutting, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds, uh, and we don't really know when a guy disappears off TV and he's getting ready for his next fight, we don't see him as walking around weight. Is non-fighting weight. It's non-training camp weight. Mm. So uh, then they go on these these regiments of where they're they're starving themselves. They're they're not staying hydrated, and I just think it's a very uh, dangerous, potentially dangerous situation. On on the and the same thing. I would say the same thing about amateur wrestling uh, in in the, around the globe. The weight that these guys pull sometimes is very dangerous. Uh, the amount of weight and the time, the length of time that they have to, to do it in. So I don't think it's just a USC issue. I think the fighters themselves, they have to realize that maybe they'll be better at, at a heavier weight, but a lot of them are, are, are cutting more weight because they perceive that the weight class that they can get to by cutting weight is easier to win at than a bigger weight. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I just think that the, the safety of the fighters is always would be my first concern, 
you damn sure don't want anybody dying because they cut too much weight and they shut their system down. And those things can happen uh, if you uh, are too drastic with your with the cut. Jim, certainly some great points there. And, you know, uh, something else I wanted to ask you about, you know, you mentioned GSP and he recently said in an interview that, um, you know, he, he doesn't look, want to come back to MMA really until there's independent testing. And I know the WWE, you know, you guys, I, well, when you were in the company, there was testing being run on athletes. Do you think that the recent controversies around the PEDs um, in MMA um, had, had any impact on the sport? And is it something that sort of needs to be controlled in the sport going into the future? Is it a worrying factor, in your opinion, in MMA? Well, I think it's an issue, and I think it's an issue that has to be addressed, and I think it's an issue that, that will be addressed. You know, you've got, uh, you've got several, you got, you got a lot of fighters, and it costs a, a, a small fortune every time you do a test. Mm. Uh, there is huge costs involved in doing the, these tests, I'm not. I'm talking seven figures annually plus plus on a roster their size to randomly test uh, their fighters, uh, and it is an issue. And the issue is, is that how how do you uh, put a plan in place that uh, that is a pro prohibits or lessens the opportunity to cheat? One thing you could say is that when you do catch a cheater, uh, you take you know you, they're, you're, they're out for a year, so they're done. They're, they're, they can't fight for you for a year. They can't get licensed for a year. You've got to make penalties that are strong enough that it, dis, it dissuades people from wanting to cheat, and people are always going to want to gain an unfair advantage, no matter what you're playing. Uh, so uh, you know the, the I, I think that the drug testing is a is an issue with. Uh, with the with MMA, but they got to come up with a way that they can fund it and and get the and do the test. If you're not going to take blood, then you can't test for HGH unless something new is out that your urine will allow you to test for a human growth hormone. Mm. Uh, and the National Football League, the NFL, American Tackle Football, I believe is wrought with HGH issues. Because their players, thanks to the reunion, don't have to give blood. They just have to give urine. So uh, that's my, my issue is, is that on all levels of sports, and even my friends that live in Hollywood say in, to a large degree, and there's a lot of Hollywood leading men that are, are, uh, are users of uh, physique enhancers. So that would be performance enhancing in theory. So it's, it's, a, it's a major issue without question. And... Uh, but you got again. You got to go back and say, how do you fund it? It's easy to say what's right to do, but can you afford? I don't know how many fighters UFC. Do you guys know how many fighters they have under contract? What What do you think? Two or three hundred? Just over four hundred. Last time we checked. Okay, four hundred to test four hundred guys on an ongoing basis would cost the company literally millions and millions of dollars. And I don't know that you can. Uh, you, how do you how do you account for that? You know, well, quite frankly, you you gotta you gotta figure out how you how you're gonna do that and stay in business. But I do think that the ones that they catch, they gotta they gotta make an example out of. We're not playing this game, so maybe it will it will re restrict the decision of uh, of cheating. But uh, we have to be honest. Human nature is human nature. People, athletes, always like to gain an advantage in any way that they can. And uh, it's been that way since time immemorial. I remember back when I was a kid that they used to, people were amazed at the size of some of the Eastern European females in track and field. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like shot putters and, and javelin throwers, a discus, the, the weight, the weight, uh, the, the weight people, the field people. Mm. And it was because there were some 200 plus pounders because they were all gassed up. Mm. Same thing with the they kept winning the powerlifting championships the you know in the Eastern European they had they had great drugs and uh, and they were ahead of the Olympic testing so you're always going to fight that battle so some battles are almost not winnable but the drug testing issue has got to be one that uh, is that you can afford and is done uh, strategically and then when you catch somebody you 
you send you, you know you you send them to the woodshed long enough that they miss enough paydays, maybe they'll think twice about doing it the second time. Yeah, it's very true. Now, uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you, uh, obviously, being in the WWE for so long, you'd have seen a lot of guys that would come through with, you know, whether they were just legitimate tough guys or just had, you know, uh, legitimate backgrounds in martial arts. You know, guys like Kurt Angle had wrestling, guys like, you know, Steve Blackman, uh, you know, RVD had some kickboxing, even guys like Kozlov and uh, Santina Morella. Um, you know, it's always fun to sort of fantasize. Who are some of the guys, oh, obviously Jack Swagger with his wrestling, who are some of the guys that you think would have been, you know, would have done well in MMA had they gone into MMA instead of pro wrestling? Well, obviously, uh, Kurt, you know, anytime you're a gold medalist, Kurt Angle's name pops up. If he had been able to get to go into MMA right after the Olympics in 1996, he probably would have had a very good career mm. uh, because he was... He could have he could have fought at uh, 205 uh, very effectively, even though he won his gold medal at 220. He he was more of a he didn't have to cut much weight to be at 220. Uh, so he would be he would be exceptional at 205. Swagger is uh, would be unique if he had gone right into it after college instead of going to WWE with his uh, college background. I think uh, Dolph Ziggler, another one, if he had gone in right after uh, college. Uh, he would have been a, a real uh, viable and colorful uh, competitive MMA fighter. Those guys are some that I know. WWE is recruiting a lot of uh, outstanding amateur wrestlers to come to their performance center. And any of those guys, if they had chosen uh, the MMA route as opposed to the show business route, uh, probably could have uh, made a, a decent showing just simply because of their outstanding a collegiate uh, wrestling background. Same thing that, uh, that that Cain Velasquez has. You know, he was a great amateur at Arizona State, uh, and we're recruiting the same. They are recruiting the same kind of guys uh, that Cain was coming out of college. Same qualifications. You know, sometimes uh, m maybe more accolades, uh, but that doesn't mean they'd be better. That doesn't mean they'd be, they'd be better than Cain. But those are some of the guys that uh, I can think of off the top of my head. The greatest pro wrestler that, that would have been the, the, the most dominant USC fighter uh, is an old-timer by the name of Dan Hodge. And Dan Hodge was never beaten in college in three years. Uh, he won every match. He was a three-time national champion. And then he, after he got out, he went to two Olympic Games, once as a teenager and then once after he got out of college. And then uh, he decided he wanted to learn to box. So essentially without any boxing training, he became the amateur heavyweight boxing champion of Golden Gloves wow. in the United States. But what you would have is a, a guy that has never been beaten in college, uh, and he goes and had never boxed before and beats every heavyweight in America that had training. And so you would have that combination of athleticism going into the USC. Now, unfortunately... Uh, Dan Hodge is, is in his 80s. He can still take an apple and pulverize it and make it into pulp and juice mm. with his grip at 82. Mm -hmm. wow. But he was a freak of nature. He would have been the best of the best because he could have fought at uh, uh, light heavyweight or middleweight. And he could, hit, he, could, he could strike and he could take you down and he could escape a takedown. So he had everything. And I, I think that's what you look for. But a lot of guys we talk to, you know, they... But WWE, not we. I'm not with WWE, but yeah. the 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 aspect of talking to these amateur guys that Jerry Briscoe does recruit, a lot of them see that they have the potential to have a longer, uh, profitable career in WWE than they do in MMA. The shelf life is longer, and uh, and that I think that's true in general. I don't think it's a guarantee, but I think it's true in general. So that's why uh, the competition for some of these kids. You know, a lot of them we find that, well, I want to try I want to try to get to USC. But if I don't, something happens, I'd like to be able to keep this door open. And so I think that's the, that, I think that's a smart way of doing that, too. If, that, if you think you want to do USC, go, go get it out of your system. Go see if you can become mm -hmm. a star. That's what Brock Lesnar did. Mm. You know, Lesnar, Lesnar wanted to be a football player after he left WWE because he didn't like to travel. And then he almost made the NFL team, the Minnesota Vikings, the last guy cut which would have been a huge story because he hadn't played football since high school. And then he decides, uh, you know, the 
the uh, the MMA world is is right down his alley because you know he's a, he's a tough guy. Obviously, he was a great amateur. He was a one-time national champion, one-time runner-up. So he had a great amateur background. He was a two-time All-American, all that good stuff. And uh, so his third fight, he's a USC heavyweight champion. How do you figure that? You can't, you know, you can't plan for that. He's just, he's a freak of nature. And uh, I'm sure if he hadn't had diverticulitis so severely that he would still be fighting in the USC and making great money, working two or three times a year, which is what he loves to do. Mm. Uh, so, but at least he's back in WWE now, where he's still earning a great living and he's not on the road all the time. So, you know, he's making the most of it. But Lester is without question the best that I recruited. And I saw, but I think Lesnar, his his dominance in the UFC would have been uh, trumped by Dan Hodge if Hodge had been uh, around at that time. You know, if he was if, the, if he was coming out of college now, the, I'm sure Dana and the Fertitas would be giving him a lot of money to sign with the uh, UFC because he had he was he was the first wrestler on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Wow. Number one magazine, sports magazine in the states, is Sports Illustrated. He was the first wrestler, April first, nineteen fifty-seven. So he's been he's a he's a freak of nature, but he would have been great in the USC. So yeah, it, it just depends on what you want to go for. You know, uh, Jack Jack Swagger uh, thought about MMA, had a chance to go do it. A lot of the guys he knew from amateur wrestling were in it. He could have got in it. But he decided to go another route, and uh, I don't think he has any regrets uh, because, you know, you're, it is a more strenuous. This travel is more strenuous, but the the toll on your body arguably is a more rapid uh, decline in USC than it is in WWE simply because of the nature of the presentation, even though a WWE guy uh, will go through their body pretty quick, too, if they don't take care of it. Some great points there, Jim. I was just wondering, speaking of Brock Lesnar, you know, sometimes over here in Australia, we always get into these heated debates sometimes at the pub when watching the fights about Brock. And one of these debates that we have is, um, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it, is um, do you think that Brock would have had a longer career um, if he didn't take so much damage um, in his wrestling career part prior to going to the UFC. Um, you know, there's been a lot of recorded concussions that he had in the WWE from his matches. Do you think that played a little bit of a factor as well on, on uh, how short his MMA career was along, obviously, with his uh, health condition that he had as well? No, I think the big issue in uh, Brock's uh, uh, UFC career was uh, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, uh, his stomach issues where he almost died. Uh, I think that was the biggest culprit of all. The only concussion that I'm aware that uh, that I can recall, and I hired Brock Lesnar and I recruited Brock Lesnar and I managed him his entire run at WWE, uh, was at WrestleMania 19 where he tried to do the shooting star press and he landed on his head yeah. while wrestling an ankle. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was a very serious uh, miscalculation. He should never have tried to move in hindsight. Those that gave him the advice to do it were wrong. And, uh, you know, he had been nailing it uh, in uh, off-Broadway, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the the, the alleged uh, litany of concussions or his WWE injuries had any bearing whatsoever on his, his uh, USC run. Pro-Archon, I, I think that uh, the diverticulitis issue was what really sapped him of a lot of strength and uh, almost put him down for the, for the count, for real. And then I don't think he ever was really himself when he came back uh, to fight that last uh, time. He just, he, he wasn't, I don't know if his mind wasn't in it or he knew that he couldn't be what he was or he had doubts. I don't really know. But when he came back from surgery, he wasn't the same guy. So I'm thinking that the diverticulitis and the diverticulosis uh, were the main culprits in his uh, USC career becoming somewhat abbreviated. Now, Jim, I wanted to ask you, because, uh, you know, people, the, the two products, WWE and the UFC, there's a lot of crossover in terms of fans and appeal. Uh, I know that Vince and Triple H have often said that the two are completely different products, um, not in any way competition. What are your thoughts in, in on 
on the two products in terms of the similarities, the differences, and do you think they are competitors in any way? I think that, that uh, they are two entirely different uh, genres, but I think that the uh, there is competition. I disagree with the other assessment. Uh, when pay-per-view, when both are in the pay-per-view world, and uh, WWE is not in the traditional pay-per-view world as much as they used to be, with their WWE Network uh, launching. Mm. But when you are looking for disposable income, and all of us only have so much of that to go around, and you have to decide of, of your disposable income, how much are you going to spend on entertainment, let's say a pay-per-view, for example, and you've only got so much money to go around, uh, what pay-per-view do you buy? Do you buy a WWE event? Uh, or do you buy a USC event? Uh, if you're going to go to a live event, again, go back to the disposable income issue. Uh, you've only got so much money to go around to take your buddies, your mates, your family, your whatever to uh, an event. Do you go watch WWE when it comes to your city, or do you go watch US, uh, USC? You, can, you know, some people are fortunate enough that they can afford to go to both. A lot of people aren't. So consequently, I think in that respect, uh, there is competition. One could say the same thing for a concert or uh, the ice capades or Disney on ice or any other ticketed event that plays in an arena, in a stadium, or in a, a, a regular arena. You only got so much money in the economy to go around. Who's going to get their share of it? So I think in that respect, there's competition in all those entities. And I think a lot of old-school pro wrestling fans, uh, when wrestling was a little bit more stake than sizzle uh, and uh, had a different presentation, I think that the, a lot of those fans are now USC fans and are more devotees of USC than they are of pro wrestling as they were back in the day. So I think a lot of displaced wrestling fans that are not as much fans of sports entertainment, but they like the old-school Pro wrestling, uh, I think a lot of those fans have have uh, faded to the uh, UFC MMA side, and will occasionally sample the pro wrestling, but more more often than not, they're they're in the UFC. And then the WWE then now is programming their product to appeal to a younger audience, especially children who have to bring their moms and dads with them as a rule to attend the events. So that's a that and that concept is is, is has worked for the circus and all kinds of things over the years. The kids become fans. They bring their mom and dad to the event. So, But there's still some, only so much money to go around. You've got to decide in your family budget, what can I afford to do? So, uh, I, But they are two different entities. Uh, they both require great athletic skill, and uh, they take their toll on the participants. The WWE's outcomes are predetermined. USC's are not. Uh, but they do have a lot of similarities that one brand or the other don't want to admit, but they both have a lot of similarities in them, how they market, how they build stars, how they promote attractions, how they build a lot of events. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of similarities in, in them, even though they're different, as we might say, but they are still a lot alike as, as well. Absolutely, absolutely true, Jim. And, you know, countless fans that we speak to, you know, jumped over to MMA when Brock Lesnar came into the fold as well. So definitely some great points made there. And, you know, we've got some fan questions for you, Jim. But before we jump to them, just one final question here. And we really do appreciate the time. It's It's been really eye-opening. Um, TNA, you know, they... They're a company that you never really worked with, and one of the only companies really that I can think of, one of the only major companies that you, <clears throat> you haven't really had an impact on. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts. You know, recently um, it's been reported that they lost their Spike TV deal. At one point, you know, the company was thriving with young talent. Um, what do you think? What do you think TNA is right now? And do you think they may be clo close to? Closing the doors in the future if they can't figure out a decent um, avenue to air their air their show. Well, they have to find a North American uh, cable television partner. Uh, they got to find it by the first of the year because that's what their that's when their extension with Spike uh, ends. Uh, so uh, they have to find that partner that that pays them enough rights fees uh, to help pay their to pay their bills. Uh, they can't make it 
I don't think, and this is my assumption. I am assuming that uh, TNA Impact Wrestling cannot survive long term simply on the monies they earn outside the uh, United States or outside North America. Uh, it's just the, it's just not there cumulatively, just not there to pay their bills. And other than that, they would need to they're going to have to do some uh, retooling their business model, and uh, they're going to have to uh, you know work on their budget. So uh, if they don't have that money, I think that's it's imperative that they get a an American uh, North American uh, cable outlet that, that pays them enough money to help uh, keep their doors open. But I, I hope they and I hope that they succeed. You know, uh, the they they have a potential to be a good brand. I think that they have a very viable talent roster. But uh, I would put it in terms of this way: they're just some of them are cast wrong. If you want to use a showbiz term. They're in the wrong roles, and using a an American football term, I think they're running the wrong system. Uh, I think that they uh, they're not being used. Their their talents aren't being used to fit the talent strengths. But uh, I hope they. I have a lot of friends that work there, and I hope that they 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 get a second chance, and that they succeed uh, in the future. Uh, you know, I would hate to see uh, a lot of those buddies of mine uh, be looking for work, and so that's. My thought on that, are they, but TNA is going to change the way they present their product what, if they do get in a new environment. And uh, if they do, they have to become the alternative to WWE and not, uh, a w, not be compared as a WWE-like uh, comparison. Yeah, d- definitely a tough situation for TNA, and it's hard to change, you know, for a company after so- doing something for so long. Now, uh, Jim, we basically told the fans that you were coming on the show, and uh, they sent, uh, sent in a whole bunch of questions and things they wanted to hear about from you. Uh, so do you mind if we ask you a few uh, fan questions? Okay. Uh, Camartino wants to know, what were your thoughts or your opinions on Ken Shamrock, and do you feel he got a rough going because of heat in the WWF? Uh, Kenny wanted to leave. Kenny was was just coming into his own when he left, but Ken wanted Ken had not gotten the uh, the uh, MMA out of his system. He was he was ready to reengage and wanted to have some more fights, and that's why he left WWE. There was no underlying uh, controversy or anything along those lines. He wanted to leave to go back to MMA because he thought he had unfinished business there and had some more fights in him and that's that was his first love so that's why he left but if he had stayed uh he would he would have been a major player during the attitude era uh and what i thought was evolving uh, very very nicely so kenny's a good really uh a focused uh, tough guy uh and uh, was just coming into his own when he decided to go back to uh to the mma world so i enjoyed working with him he's a he's a He's a tough guy, and he didn't, you know, he didn't, uh, he didn't have to set out because of a little, you know, nagging injury. He was always, always ready to roll. So uh, he's the kind of guy you want in your locker room. Good guy, and uh, but uh, no controversy when he left. He he just wanted to go back and take care of some unfinished business and go back to his first love. And and as it worked out, you know, he just never made it back to WWE. Uh, you know, Father Time has a way of addressing some of those issues. So. Uh, but I enjoyed working with him. Now, this question comes on Twitter, JR, at Powerhouse MMA wants to know, have you been approached to commentate on any MMA shows since leaving the WWE? I have, and, uh, you know, we just haven't been able to come to uh, terms. Still ongoing talk about that. Uh, you know, my uh, I'm working on a project now that may or may not happen. I don't, I, you know, it's, it's showbiz and contracts and lawyers, uh, sports uh, entities. You, you, you can't, uh, you can't, you can't count your money before the check's written. So, uh, yeah, I've been contacted by several people, but it's just not. It's never been. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the deal's not right. And when the deal's right, I will give it a shot. I'd like to do a, the play-by-play for an MMA show at some point in my lifetime. Uh, certainly feel like I'd do it, and uh, if I only did one, that'd be cool. But I'd like to, I'd like to try it, kind of on my bucket list of things I'd like to do. But uh, 
thus far, you know, it's, they're smaller groups, and, and uh, it just hasn't been uh, it hasn't been the cards yet. But you know, I'm not to say that it'll never happen because uh, my agent talks to somebody just about every day about uh, some some shape, form, or, or, or fashion of that whole uh, conversation. But we'll just wait and see. I think that would be awesome, and I think in a big way you'd be a draw for that event, like in the sense that if people found out like JR's commentating that event, like you know, I, you know, I'd want to tune in and be like, you know, I, I wonder how this is going to sound. It's going to be awesome. Now, um, well, yeah, the curiosity factor is good. You know, is, it, is JR going to be uh, in, in involved in a, in a car crash, or is be, you know, or is, or is this going to be better than we thought? I, I uh, a lot of people did that when I did my uh, boxing debut on Fox Sports. I did a boxing event on uh, back in May, uh, and that really got some great reviews. And as a matter of fact, if you go to YouTube or Google search Jim Ross boxing, there's like a five or six minute little uh, highlight video of that on uh, on YouTube. And all you got to do to Google is just go Jim Ross boxing; it'll take you right to it. But if, you, if people that haven't seen it might want to check it out, I think I think it's about five minutes long. It's just a little. It's a highlight of a two-hour show. So, uh, but I had fun doing it. I found out that boxing is much easier to broadcast than pro wrestling, and I'm sure, in my view, that uh, MMA would be much like uh, broadcasting old-school pro wrestling, except I didn't. I wouldn't know the ending, and quite frankly, mm-hmm. I did my best work in pro wrestling when I didn't know the endings. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't need to know who was going to win or who was going to lose. This, you know, whatever happens, you just call it, and it's more natural that way. It's more organic. So uh, that's kind of how I perceive that. But if if the right opportunity comes along that looks like it would be fun, uh, then I would certainly uh, give it a, a shot. But not with the ex- expectations that you know Dana White's going to be giving me a call and saying, "Hey, why don't you join our broadcast uh, team?" I think they've got their team in place. They've got their second team in place if they like. Uh, that's cool with me. I'm still a USC fan. It just uh, I I kind of got in that game a little bit later. The timing wasn't the best. So, uh, but but we'll you know we'll see. I, I hope that that I hope that that happens at some point in time. I really would enjoy doing uh, a MMA show, and we'll see how it goes. And time will tell, fellas. Well, we'll definitely be interested to see that. Um, another fan question. This one's coming from Silence. Uh, it'd be interesting to know uh, what your favorite commentary pairing is uh, in MMA. Now, it doesn't have to be a current pairing. It could be one from the past. Uh, but, yeah, we'd love to know your opinion on that. Well, I like uh, I like uh, Goldberg and Rogan. I think Rogan is the star of that team. But, the, but uh, Mike does a real nice job of letting Joe be the star. Uh, in that respect, uh, you know, they're, and they've gotten the, most of the big assignments. To be honest with you, I have not watched enough Bellator to give you an honest and uh, educated opinion of their broadcast guys. I've listened to, some, to them some. I don't. I certainly don't think they're bad, but the other guys get more exposure. Uh, and but it's it's you're, they're finding it's. It's challenging, you know. The the play by play guy has to got to do so much work on those shows, and then the color analyst has to understand the the genre and be able to speak in sound bites. And I think that they're finding out that a lot of their their former fighters or even their active fighters that are doing some of their studio shows are being challenged to uh, be entertaining and informative and speak in sound bites. So uh, it's not a it's not a layup. It's it's challenging to do, but I would I would go with uh, Goldberg and Rogan right now because uh, they're the they're the top team on the top brand doing the best shows. Absolutely, I'd love to hear you and Paul Heyman do a show one day. That would be <laughs> that, that would be amazing. Now, um, and one final uh, actually fan question before we jump to the tap out round, Jim uh, Rooster Verdan has an interesting question. Um, he wants to know what's your opinion on. Who would win in a wrestling match between Cain Velasquez and Jack Swag- Swagger? Obviously, both highly decorated wrestlers, both had a great career. Who do you think would win that one in a wrestling match? And in an yeah, amateur yeah. wrestling match, sorry. Amateur I mean. wrestling match. Yeah. Oh gosh, it, it would be uh, it, that would be an interesting match because they're both. Uh, 
I should say their skill sets are very, very comparable. Uh, I would have to probably uh, lean toward uh, Velasquez uh, simply because of his higher finishes in the NCAA tournament than Swagger had, and that would be the only reason. Uh, Swagger was a two-time All-American, but he didn't finish in the Nationals as high as Kane did. So based on that, I would probably uh, give uh, uh, Kane the the nod uh, over my uh, fellow Oklahoman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it would be, I think it would be a very competitive uh, uh, contest without question. Certainly be entertaining. Um, now, Jim, before we wrap up, we're going to do something we do with all our guests. It's called the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. It's basically where we, uh, a bunch of fun questions, we fire them off at you, and you want to answer with the first thing that comes to your mind, similar to word association. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, so, Jim, uh, Aussies love barbecue. Uh, obviously, you're a man who knows his barbecue sauces and barbecue in general. What sauce does JR recommend for the best barbecue here in Australia? Well, somebody as a food distributor is going to get smart on this question and, get, and, and make a lot of money because uh, we need to find a, a distributor to uh, to distribute our products in Australia. But the one that I would go with is uh, a spinoff of my mother's old recipe that my wife perfected called JR's Original Barbecue Sauce. And uh, it's a rich, sweet, and savory. So JR, JR's Original. Mm, I feel like barbecue already. Now, JR, in hindsight, do you think that Brawl for All was a mistake? And is it true that Bart Gunn ruined the WWE's plans when he won instead of Dr. Death? No, uh, you've been reading Bob Holly's book, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I talked to Bob Holly a couple of days ago. He's going to be on my podcast, uh, The Ross Report, which is doing great. And uh, uh, the, the first of all, the, the Brawl for All, Brawl for It All, was a ridiculous creative idea that should never have happened. Uh, a lot of guys got injured. Uh, it caused uh, dissension among certain pockets of talent in the locker room, which wasn't there before. Uh, and Dr. Death, the, the brawl for it all was not designed for Dr. Death to get over. It was designed for whoever won it to get over more until someone had the brilliant idea to have the winner fight Butterbean, who was a professional <laughs> boxer and a four-round specialist. Uh, and then whoever would have won the brawl for it all would have been knocked out by Butterbean, no matter who it was. <laughs> yeah. It just happened to be uh, uh, Mark Gunn, who was one of our strongest. Uh, he was a reliable, good, dependable guy. And the, the, the tales of my uh, leading his demise and him out of the company are somewhat mis- misguided and exaggerated. Uh, you never want to run off someone that is no problem, that is a good performer, that is a great team player. You can't get too many of those guys. So it makes absolutely zero sense that I would ever want to run Mark Gunn off of WWE. And uh, But, you know, some talents, like Bob, you know, their perception is what they, they he wrote what he believed to be true. And all, I, and and we're going to podcast about this uh, in a few weeks, and talk about it. But the uh, uh, that whole brawl for it all thing was uh, very. It was a creative idea that was that went awry, and a lot of guys got hurt. And at the end of the day, it meant it didn't mean a damn thing. It was it was absolutely a waste of time. And uh, and and did we think that Doc would have would have won it? If it if it had been more MMA style, uh, he had no experience in boxing. He was a wrestler, and when he put gloves on a on a wrestler, boxing gloves on a wrestler, you you somewhat slow down their their game. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of how I look at that deal. But nonetheless, uh, uh, anyway, that's where we are. Yeah, one of those one of those hilarious, infamous moments in uh, pro wrestling that it's full of. Uh, now, Jim, what is your favorite movie featuring The Rock? Oh, uh, I liked uh, I liked. Uh, uh, I'm getting beeped here because I've got another interview to do. Uh, I liked. Uh, uh, oh God, what was the name of that one? That uh, Walking Tall. Ah, yeah, of course, classic. Because I like the I, I like the original Walking Tall. 
I met the original Buford Pusser, and and The Rock was a character uh, that came from that, and he did a great job in that film. Uh, I liked it. Uh, I liked that. I liked that film a lot. And and the one where he was uh, the bounty hunter and retrieving the the kid's son. Uh, Snitch. Welcome to the uh, jungle. Was it? Yeah, that jungle thing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good times. Yeah, some of the, some of his earlier work definitely fantastic. Uh, Jim, in your opinion, do you think Sting will ever actually wrestle in the WWE? Yeah, I do. One time, WrestleMania 31. Awesome, awesome. A lot of fans can't wait for that. Uh, in all your years in pro wrestling, Jim, what would you say was your highlight? I'm uh, going into the WWE Hall of Fame, 2007. Do you think that we'll ever see Kurt Angle back in the WWE before he retires? Only if he can pass a full physical that satisfies the WWE medical team because of his neck. Now, Jim, are you familiar with Stipe Miocic in the UFC, and have you noticed how much he sounds like Stone Cold? I have not. I'm, I am not, but I will I'll start paying attention. Speaking of Stone Cold, the one thing that every fan talks about is if he ever returns. Do you ever see Stone Cold return for one last match at WrestleMania? I'd like for it to happen. I don't think it will. Uh, now, Jim Ross, uh, we've never had a chance to see JR in person in Australia. Now, have you uh, have a little bit of now that you have a little bit of time on your hands? Can we see Jim Ross down under? My promoters are working with promoters in Australia to bring my uh, one man show there, and I'm I'm pushing for it to happen. I'm pushing for it to happen. Hope it happens next year. Well, there you guys go. You might see JR in person next year. You can check out Jim on his website at www.jr's barbecue.com follow him on twitter at jr's barbecue and check out jim's podcast the ross report through podcast one especially check out episode 20 if you're an mma fan where jim catches up with ronda rousey it's a great great listen and jim has a wealth of information i reckon this interview could go for three days and jim could just tell us about a bunch of amazing facts but unfortunately we have to cut it here jim is a very very busy man uh jim thank you so much for coming on submission radio Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great day, and uh, and I'm looking forward to. I have never been to Australia. I need to get there. We'll make that happen sometime, and maybe we're going to find somebody that's going to bring JR's products there as well. So, uh, a lot of big things could happen down under, and we're anxious to be a part of it. And that was Jim Ross. What a legend. You know, I know a lot of MMA fans aren't really big fans of uh, pro wrestling, but, you know, Jim Ross, really a man that knows a lot about both and really interesting to get his opinions on um, particularly MMA and um, really interesting to hear what he said about the MMA judging cast because, as you know, what we'll talk about next is UFC 177 and uh, the weight cutting and the judging um, especially the weight cutting is something that affected the um, the event. Um, Jim Ross spoke about weight cutting, how he's worried about certain people cutting too much weight, how it's bad for their health. And unf unfortunately, Hennon Burrell um, was a victim of that coming into this one. Isn't that right, Cass? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Hennon Burrell, a lot of people have said that him and Jose Aldo, Jose Aldo obviously being in the division above, him and Jose weigh pretty much the same. But because Jose is the champ at, a, at 145 pounds in featherweight, Burrell cuts all the way down to bantamweight uh, so that obviously the two don't have to fight each other, which is completely understandable. But, you know, Burrell's a big guy. He cuts a lot of weight. It's been said very often he cuts a lot of weight. Um, he's a pretty big bantamweight. People have talked about, you know, his cardio and things like that in the past. Not that it's been a major factor, but a lot of people have been, uh, you know, suspicious over it. And in this case, let's not forget, this is a really quick turnaround for Burrell as well. Uh, the guys fought, you know, barely a few months ago. So with, I think with a combination of the fact that the rematch was booked so soon after, you know, he got knocked out. It's not like he lost a brutal decision. He got knocked out. Um, and the fact that he cuts a lot of weight, it's sort of not too surprising. So really interesting to hear JR's thoughts about that. What did you think about this whole uh, Hannon Burrell situation, Dennis, with the, him? Obviously, you know, there's there's different rumors, things that he, mm. people saying that he passed out. Uh, so I think someone said that he was in a bathtub. But essentially, the general consensus is he felt ill, he felt sick, he couldn't continue the weight cut, and some sources saying that he passed out. So what did you think about this one, Dennis? Well, you know, UFC 177 definitely uh, plagued with a lot of fights being pulled out. Um, mm. First, the card looked amazing. Two title fights. 
You know, um, Sacramento's own TJ Dillashaw with an exciting rematch. When I first heard the news, I thought it was one of those final blows like in Mortal Kombat where it just go, the, the game goes, finish him, mm. you know, and it's just like, wow, this is absolutely rock bottom for, you know, UFC 177. And I know that a lot of fans, um, they, went, they went on our Twitter and they said, look, we're not going to pay for something like this. Um, they voiced their opinion, um, submission, uh, submission AUS on Twitter if you guys want to check us out. But, um, yeah, I thought this was going to be a difficult one to sell. Now, um, I was a little bit surprised when they found a replacement in uh, Soto. I thought, wow, um, TJ Dillashaw willing to fight, uh, fight on is a great thing. Obviously, you know, uh, John Bone Jones um, pulled out of UFC 151. It wasn't um, a day's notice. It was, I think it was a little, 10 days, yeah. Um, he pulled out of that one. So the whole card was canceled. And I know that's horrible for the fighters on that card. I didn't want to see that happening with UFC 177. At the same time, I thought, will this be a free event? Um, you know, how many people will be paying for it? Now, um, I, you and me, Cass, we watched this event. But, uh, you know, we've had a few we had a few friends in pubs all around Melbourne here in Australia, the, the cards on during the day. And I heard some positive things. Um, I heard that some of the big pubs around Melbourne were full with people watching the fight. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because they didn't want to buy it themselves. You know, yeah. You never know. But um, there were quite a few people there. But, yeah, I was, I was a little bit dumbfounded by this one. It was definitely one of the sort of least attractive cards that I've seen UFC produce in a while, and especially compared to some of their fight night cards. Um, yeah, the lineup just wasn't on the same level. What did you think, Cass? Man, you've got two fight night cards that are coming up that are going to be a lot, lot better than the lineup that we've had, you know, at UFC 177. And I thought that from the very beginning that this card was booked very, very wrongly. Like, you had two title fights, both of them very lower weight divisions, which, as we know, often don't draw quite as much. So you had, obviously, TJ Dillashaw versus Hennon Barrow. The whole card was basically... Uh, that that was the main attraction right there. That was the one big thing that people were looking forward mm. to. I'm just going to be honest with you. No one cared about the Demetrius Johnson fight. He's a fantastic fighter, but the general public haven't taken an interest in him. And then you've had, obviously, Tony Ferguson versus Danny Castillo, and then, you know, Beige Correa versus Shayna Baszler. I mean, those aren't really massive fights. You know, Tony Ferguson, Danny Castillo, uh, they're not even the top of the lightweight division. So I think, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of good fighters on the card, but not a, not a lot of major attractions that are going to get the casual fan or the mm. guy that, you know, isn't willing to spend, you know, 50 55 or whatever, $49 on the card to, you know, really do that. So I think I think there was a lot of issues with this one. And then, you obviously, once the Demetrius Johnson fight was moved, the card was really just relying on that one big fight, TJ mm. Dillashaw versus Hennon Barrow. And I thought even that was going to be very risky. And it was crazy. Waking up that morning, I was like, I have a funny feeling. And I'm like, man, could you imagine if that fight... And I had a feeling it was Barrow too. It was just this random thing. You know, I was just like, man, could you imagine if like Barrow pulled out? And then I opened up Twitter and everything. <laughs> boom. He's out. You know, you see those fake posters where people have, like, spray-painted Hannah Burrell's face. So love those. Like, love oh, those. Good, yeah. good stuff to the community. <laughs> Jesus. But, yeah, that, that's just crazy. And, uh, you know, the, the thought did cross my mind, like, man, is it going to be a free card now? I am just as excited, uh, you know, as far as, obviously, the event, I was just as, as excited to see the actual pay-per-view buys. I really want to see how many people bought this mm. card. I think one of the lowest ones recently was the Demetrius Johnson card, and there was UFC 174, which I don't think was that bad. Like, you obviously had Arlovsky and Schwab, and um, yeah, you had, you had a few names there. So I think this is going to be doing really badly. And, you know, guys like us, we obviously support the product. We want to support MMA, support UFC. We want it to be massive here in Australia, but even guys like us were, you know, really sort of wrestling with, you know, do we buy the card or do we go to a pub and watch it there? Yeah, you know, it was definitely a case of the UFC spreading themselves out too thin. And, um, you know, the UFC have to expect something like this. It's just something that happens when, you know, you, you have that many cards going at once. And I think it's something that they'll have to try and think about in the future as well. How can they manage this? But just from a promotional standpoint, before we get into the card, I really think that the um, Betch Korea versus Shayna Baszler fight, um, I think that had a really great build up to it. And I mm. feel like the UFC really should have built the card more around that. Um, I think Tony Ferguson and Danny Castillo has a little 
yeah, there's a lot of interest for the Sacramento fans. I don't think people outside of Sacramento or America really uh, care about Ferguson that much, or even Danny, even though Danny, you know, he's been around the sport for so long. I really th- thought this career baszler um, rivalry really had something there. I thought it was a great build-up. It was a wrestling-style build-up, you know. Um, and with, with the popularity of Ronda Rousey, I really thought that the UFC should have tapped into that. Um, got their marketing machine happening, you know, more UFC embedded clips about that, more more stuff in the countdown about that. What's going to happen? Is she going to take Shayna out? Is Rousey next? She's already taken one person out. This, you know, um, Betch, she, Betch, how do I say it, Cass? Beth, Betch. I want to say Beach. I, I think Beach. That's yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not great. I'm not great with these names. Sorry, guys. But, you know, Beach, she's got this intense look on her face. She's a personality, man, and she she speaks Brazilian. So I don't think a lot of people outside of Brazil really know what she's saying a lot of the time. But if she spoke English, I reckon she would be a great, great heel. Um, she's already a great heel without speaking English, just with the translator. And I really think the UFC could have, you know, pulled a lot of interest with that fight. Um, you know, women's MMA is hot right now. Ronda Rousey, Ronda Rousey's hot right now. Baszler, you know, she put out these blogs and it got a lot of heat from the MMA fans. Um, you know, she was basically telling him, you know, I've been in the sport for so long and you guys have no idea what I'm capable of and what I've been through. And a lot of fans sort of took negatively to that. But negative or positive, as you and me uh, know, Cass, a reaction's a reaction. Now, if the UFC put their marketing machine on that, um, had Shayna Baszler jump on TV, say, look, I've been in the sport for this long and, you know, I don't know who this bait chick is. Uh, thinks she is, but she's not taking me out, and I'm going to be a champion, and she's not getting to Ronda Rousey. I'm going to take, you know, something brutal. I really think the UFC could have built something around that and really brought more interest to it. Now, during the weigh-ins, that was there was a legitimate buzz around their weigh-in. There was a bit of a tingle, you know, when they squared off. I really think the UFC could have milked that a bit more and probably got a couple more buys out of it. Um, but, yeah, that's that's just my two cents on that one. Well, you know what? Shayna Baszler, she's a gamer, and you mentioned pro wrestling. She loves pro wrestling. She's always down to, uh, you know, cut a promo. She tried to do that in the Ultimate Fighter in the house and cut promos. So I think if she was asked to do things like that, she would have been more than happy to do it. And it's one thing to, you know, post on your blog uh, where a few people will see, but it's another thing to get the UFC marketing machine behind her. And, you know, you mentioned that Beach doesn't really speak much English. Well, I mean, if you look at pro wrestling, you look at rivalries like, you know, any, anyone patriotic, uh, like Sergeant mm. Slaughter against, like, Nikolai Volkov, you don't necessarily mm. have to speak much English. Here, you, they can play it as, you know, he's this, you know, Brazilian chick, and she's taken down the four horsemen one by one like an assassin. And I think that's something really cool. And I think there's a lot of people, maybe hardcore MMA fans, a lot of them may not like Ronda Rousey just because of certain things. But I think the general public, they do like Ronda Rousey for the whole, you know, girl power mm. and empowering women and the fact that she's so successful. And you can have, you know, this Beach Carrera coming down to basically, you know, mow all these girls down. And, uh, you know, Americans, they're very patriotic people. So I think they're going to stand by Shayna Baszler regardless. And if you've got this, you know, outsider in Beach, I think that can sell really well. So you're absolutely right. I really think they should have uh, they should have plugged this fight a lot more. But you know what? Since we're talking about this fight, we'll get to Yancey and uh, Ramsey Ninja fight. Let's talk about the fight. Uh, promotion or not promotion? What did you think of this one, Dennis? Uh, the Yancey Damon Jackson fight. No, no, I meant I went Beige Carrera versus oh. Shane Basil. What we're talking about. Uh, okay, well, you know, <laughs> here's the problem. Um, Shayna Baszler has been in the sport for so long, and I have a lot of respect for her. Um, I haven't been impressed with Shayna for a really, really long time, and I'll be honest, I haven't been a big Shayna uh, Baszler follower. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a hardcore MMA fan, like a, a lot of the listeners listening right now. But um, haven't been the biggest follower of women's MMA. Um, looked through uh, Shayna's fights, and you know, she she's a trooper, man, for being in the sport so early, for doing what she's done for the sport. She absolutely deserves everybody's respect. I just don't. Uh, I'm just not impressed with her performances as of late. And uh, her performance against Beach just wasn't very um, wasn't very good at all. Um, she displayed some good grappling in the first round. Um, she, she looked a little bit small for the division. Um, but yeah, in terms of the striking, it's just, it's just one of those things. I, I know we spoke to, um, Jason Perillo about this before. Um, you know, he trained Cyborg and spoke to us a little about a little bit about the underdevelopment in, in the striking game of WMMA. But I really think, um, that chain of striking wasn't good whatsoever. And, um, there was just no strategy in that one when she was up against the fence. You know, letting Beige, you know, tee off on her. 
um, you know, and I, I suppose everybody thought, why, why stay on the fence, try and get off? And, you know, the saying goes, once you get punched in the face, all game plans go, go, game plans go out the window. But it was just, yeah, it was a little bit difficult to watch um, in, in the sort of second part of that fight and um, in the second round of that fight. And I know her, she wanted to go out there and, and wrestle Beach and, you know, take her down and, and then put it in one of those um, wrestling holds that Josh Barnett taught her. But it's just, she just, just doesn't have a complete game. She needs a striking game, which she doesn't have. I'm sure she's a competent grappler. But this isn't Meta Morris. This isn't Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competition. And I think women's MMA might have advanced past, past chain of base, as, as harsh as that sounds. Now, Beach Korea, um, she looked good. Um, maybe she can work a little bit on some of the grappling herself, some of the wrestling in her game. I think perhaps she can focus on that. But her striking, her striking is good. And what I like about this girl is I think she might be like the Vanderlei Silver of uh, women's MMA in, in the sense that she gets in there. She's so intense in those stare downs, man. She's just on her like on another planet. I, I'd rather fight a, a male MMA fighter than her. I think she, she scares the crap out of me. Um, and she's so game to fight, to get in there and... But at the same time, Beach doesn't have much head movement. She just runs forward with the punches. So, yeah, but it was just, it was a little bit difficult for me to watch. And I think it'll be a little bit difficult for Shayna to bounce back from this one. I'm sure UFC will keep her around for another fight. And she's been away for so long. But I think it'll be a bit difficult for Shayna to bounce back from this loss now that the mainstream MMA UFC fans have seen a fight a couple of times and it that wasn't very good, but um, I'm hoping she can, you know, pick up some skills in the striking department for the next one. What did you think of this one, Cass? I agree with you 100 percent that uh, <laughs> you know Beige Carrera definitely scares me. I thought, just on a side note, when you said that uh, she scares even you, I thought you were going to go the Paul Heyman route at WrestleMania 17, where he said Kane even scares me, and I am a man of no fear. <laughs> but that's just a little side note. Look, one of the things you got to respect about. Uh, Shayna Baszler is obviously that she's been competing in the sport for a long time. She's been competing since 2003. She's 34. She's no spring chicken. Now, that's one of the things, one of the reasons why you have to respect her, but it's also a bit of a detriment because, as we all know, MMA, it's a young man's game or a young woman's game. Now, she's versed a lot of the best of the best. She's versed, uh, you know, girls like Alexis Davis, Sarah McMahon. I was watching some of her fights the other day, actually, just to catch up. Alexis Davis, Sarah McMahon, uh, Sarah Corfum. Uh, Jan Finney, she's won against Julie Kedzie. A lot of those top girls, though, she's lost to. So, you know, her already getting into this division, it was a bit of a tough one. She obviously lost to Juliana Pena, who was another up-and-comer. So already mm. she's lost to most of the elite girls in the division. Factor in the fact that she hasn't had a fight since January of last year. That's a long time, man. That's like well over a year and a half. That's going on two years. You know, the the odds are really stacked against her. Then you got a girl like, you know, Beige Carrera, who's been very, very active. She's been on an absolute roll. She disposed of Jessamine Duke not too long ago. I think this is a really tough com fight coming in for Shayna Baszler. And uh, not really anything to do with her skill, just more the fact that Beige was on such a roll and Shayna Baszler was just on the shelf with injuries. And I think mm. Cage Rust played a big part of it. I think to a degree she kind of forgot what it was like to be in that cage, to be against a live opponent, not just someone who she was sparring against. And you're right, I mean, in the second round, that was just absolutely brutal. Big John McCarthy gave her so many chances. And you know what? She, i got to give it to her because she tried to fight back. I think she did all, all that she could uh, you know, to basically keep that fight going. But unfortunately, John, Big John McCarthy had no choice but to stop that fight, to stop her from, you know, really suffering any serious damage. Good good on her for taking those punches. I mean, the girl's obviously got a crazy chin, but when you're just getting teed off against the fence, uh, yeah, there's really not much else you can do other than stop the fight. But you know what? Hey, I'm impressed with Kohea. I don't know. I, I mean... I, Look, I, don't, I still don't think she's a challenger to Ronda Rousey. She could be a dark horse like Rashad Evans in Ultimate Fighter 2. Uh, but it doesn't <laughs> matter. The fact is we've got a challenger. We've got someone who's interesting, and there's a good backstory. If the UFC's mm. smart, they're going to really play on this whole four horsemen, four, sorry, four horsewomen thing and uh, really try and get the fans behind it. And I really think if they're smart, they'll do this whole Brazil versus America thing because you know, every, everybody loves those kind of fights. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, she's definitely someone who the UFC can really build up before that Ronda Rousey fight. Um, and, yeah, I agree with you. Millions could be made off that fight. And just on a side note, the weird little dance she does, <laughs> she did after that fight with, with a bit of the ass shaking. I don't, I don't know whether I, I needed to be turned on or scared for my life as I was watching that. So. I'm not opposed to it.
<laughs> We're not opposed to it here at Submission Radio. A couple of perverts. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no doubt, Joe. Um, but Kit, let's talk about the fight card. You know, kicking off, you had Yancey Medeiros uh, against Damon Jackson. This is a pretty crazy fight. This is uh, really fun to begin with. Damon Jackson really wanted to slow down Yancey Medeiros. Yancey obviously coming off a loss in his last fight. Trains with the Diaz brothers. Used to be, uh, I'm trying to think, I think he used to be a middleweight. He used to be a lot bigger. And now he's competing, yeah. at, now he's competing at lightweight. Crazy, 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 crazy. Uh, you know, he's got a lot of power for, for a guy with his frame. Maybe from carrying all that weight uh, back in the day. Beautiful body punches. Uh, he had some nice strikes. He really kind of got in there with Damon, even though Damon was really trying to slow him down, press him against the cage. Yancey he was happy to be there, and uh, you know he he went he went for some moves. And in the second round, that that crazy sort of on the fly inverted like bulldog choke, inverted guillotine, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll we'll double check with Joe Rogan what what he wants to call it. But it was kind of like you know Damon went for that typical. Uh, escape from from a uh, from a gear team by basically turning himself, and uh, you know most guys will let go, or most guys will be able to slip out and pop their head through. Yancey, I don't know whether it was through sheer stubbornness or just belief in the fact that he could finish it, but he held on and he dragged him to the ground and kind of got like a almost like a side control, almost like a sort of like an arm triangle. It was I don't know, it was crazy, but it was an awesome submission. Joe Rogan went bananas. I'm always happy when that happens, and it was a nice, sexy win for Yancey Madera. Yeah. So what did you think, Dennis? Yeah, absolutely agree with you, Yancey. Someone we should watch. You know, obviously started off as career in a much higher division, really got his stuff together, and you know a couple of impressive wins now. Um, from Yancey, he's, he's, uh, well, I mean, he lost against Jim Miller, but, um, you know, Yancey is someone we, we should j definitely watch Jim Miller's no slouch. So, oh, yeah. um, uh, really interesting. And you know what? The thing that Yancey did that people aren't going to give him credit for is, um, people were on Twitter, people were on Facebook, people were on the internet and they go, all right, UFC 177 made card kicks off with an awesome rare submission that people don't usually see. And I actually think that got the hype going for the card. Um, I saw a lot of people going, you know, what if what if there's going to be like amazing submissions every fight? What if this is going to turn out to be one of the best cards, even though it's not stacked? I think it kind of got everybody excited for it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that if it was a bit of a slow, boring fight, I think it would have taken away a lot away from the card. But I think him having such an exciting finish uh, might have even gotten a couple of people to buy the card late or get in there a bit more, or get a bit more excited about the card. And I think that's what was needed with an event like UFC 177. Yeah, I think with Yancey, you know, the sky's the limit for this guy. He's an interesting guy to watch. I mean, with Jim Miller, he obviously stepped up on short notice. You know, he had the no contest against Eve Edwards, and then he got in with, obviously, Rustam uh, Kabulov. So he's first a murderer's row. So good to see him taking care of Damon Jackson. Uh, we are running a little bit low on time, so we'll get to the next fight. Obviously, you had Ramsey Nijem against Carlos Diego Ferreira. Now, Ramsey Nijem coming into this fight, I was reading an article about him. You know, he's obviously of Palestinian descent. You know, he's a really nice guy, and he, he says he's basically fighting for Palestine for peace. You know, he, he waits mm -hmm. for the day that war will be over. You know, he had an awesome fight in uh, Abu Dhabi against uh, Benil Dariush. Uh, you know, got that win. Would have been a sick, sick win for him in Abu Dhabi, and he was trying to make it. I believe two or three in a row. That would sorry, this this fight would have made it three in a row. Unfortunately, and I know Dennis, you love talking about this. Guys who often train at the pit, uh, you know, they go in guns blazing, they bum rush their opponents, they have crazy offense, but they often just don't quite have it in the defensive department. And that's mm -hmm. basically what we saw in this fight. You know, uh, Ramsey Nijem, he he had some really good success here. He dropped uh, he dropped Carlos in the first round, I think at least twice. And Carlos is a gamer, man. He was nonstop. You know, even when he was on the bottom, he's throwing up submissions, going him going for guillotines, going for arm bars, nonstop busy. And uh, you know, watching Rams get dropped towards the end of the round, and even at the start of the second round, it was kind of scary. And uh, you know, I, I know you like to talk about this, Dennis. Guys who don't keep their hands up. What did you think about this one? Yeah, absolutely agree with you. Unfortunately, Ramsey um, is a victim of it because, you know, he's gotten so many excited, exciting wins from these crazy knockouts. But at the same time, um, keeping those hands low has its price. And, you know, we, we spoke about um, NBA 2K14 when you get your three-point 
three-pointers in, mm. and then you start shooting three-pointers for the rest of the match because, you know, you got that three-pointer and it becomes almost addictive and it's very difficult to change out of your game. Um, yeah, you know, Ramsey is a bit of a favorite of ours in the sense that, you know, we know so much about him. We, we've seen him compete for a lot of years and, you know, hopefully he can um, fix, fix some of the flaws in his game. But you know, nevertheless, an exciting fight. Some of the uh, some of the good things to come out of was the fact that it was fight of the night. They both got fifty dollar bonuses, and even good $50. old Yance, fifty dollar bonuses. They're going to go buy themselves a, a new hat. No, they got fifty thousand dollar bonuses. How about that? Um, that? That was a little trick there. Um, Yancey got a fifty thousand dollar bonus, um, and for guys like that, um, that's a lot of money to be made. So I'm, I'm happy they were able to walk away well paid from this event. I hope Yancey doesn't take the Simpsons route and gets like a barrel full of tacos because <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be fighting back up at middleweight in no time. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. Now, after the Beige Cohera and Ashana Baszler fight, there was obviously the, the co-main event. My, Mike Goldberg will lie to you and tell you it was the main event. It was not. It was the co-main event, Tony Ferguson versus Danny Castillo. Now, this is one that caused a little bit of controversy, mm. which I don't think was very warranted. I mean, this is this is a good fight. I actually enjoyed it. Uh, even I think the crowd is pretty. I think the crowd is pretty educated in this one. When when uh, Tony Ferguson almost hit the first ever RKO in mixed martial arts, when he went for that da- dust choke, um, <laughs> I think a lot of the crowd knew what was happening. There was a few boos. Th- those were the uneducated people, but people knew. I think Tony Ferguson he fought a good fight up until sort of towards the end when he went for that crazy rolling knee bar. And I can appreciate, you know, people going out there and trying to be exciting. I just think, man, you're doing well in the fight. You had a fairly close, shaky second, which I still think Tony Ferguson won because Danny Castillo didn't do anything on top. And then uh, Tony Ferguson went for that rolling knee bar and ended up on the bottom. And it's like, man, you know against a guy like Danny Castillo, you're going to struggle to get up. You may be active. You may be able to do things and throw up submissions. But, you know, he's he, he can keep guys down. So I really don't know what why he was going for that rolling knee bar, unless he really, really thought he had it, which it didn't look like. But just on the fight, you know, a lot of people on on the Twitterverse and the MMA community, um, I was actually surprised. I was going through Twitter. A lot of people had Danny Castillo winning that fight. I, however, did not because, man, you know, he, he held Tony Ferguson down. He didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. He barely landed any shots. I think after his first takedown, I think it was round one or round two. He finally threw a big elbow. And even Joe Rogan was saying, you know, he needs to do a lot more of that. And he just didn't. And after his post-fight mm. speech, I, I like Danny Castillo. You know, he's, he's a good guy. He's very hard to dislike. Um, but he was saying how, you know, he was landing bombs. and He was going for the finish. I have to disagree with that. I don't, I didn't see the bombs. I didn't see him going for the finish. I thought that was crazy. I don't know whether he was just being defensive or he thought he was winning. But, man, he did not do a whole lot to win that fight. I, I was impressed with his takedowns, I will say that. And I was thinking about it just the other day. I was kind of chilling out, you know, nighttime. I was alone in my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it's kind of somewhere else. But I was just thinking about, you know, yep. the whole takedowns and MMA judging and things like that and how takedowns. I think I was, I was actually, I think I was playing uh, EA UFC and I lost a few fights. And I was like, fucking judges. Even in the games, they don't get it right. I did the damage, but I got held down. And I kind of thought, you know what? In a fight, in a, it, it takes a lot to hold another man down. If you're fighting a guy and he's trying to hit you and you take him, you put him on the ground on his back and he's trying to get up and you are holding him there, that's got to count for something. So I kind of, it got, kind of got me thinking like, yeah, you know what? I guess I sort of understand when, you know, when judges kind of go towards, uh, you know, the, the wrestling heavy guys because, hey, they, they are stopping another man from doing what he wants. In this case, I would sort of disagree because Tony Ferguson, he seemed pretty content to be on the ground. He's throwing up submissions. He's throwing elbows from the bottom. It's not like he was struggling and struggling, you know, like a like a uh, Numero Gometo fight where the guy's just struggling to get up and he just can't do anything. He's being ragdolled. It wasn't like that. It was Danny Castillo basically taking a nap on Tony Ferguson's chest and uh, Tony Ferguson was, you know, stroking his head to sleep with elbows. So I really think mm-hmm. that Tony Ferguson definitely deserved the mm-hmm. nod, and I don't think it was uh, it was as controversial as people see. And, sorry, I know I've been going on a tangent, Dennis, but 
the thing is, a lot of people get shitty with these wrestling heavy decisions. They say, oh, you know, he was on top of him. Why, why the wrestlers? Why they get? What do they get favorited? Oh, they didn't do anything. People are saying that all the time, and then it's crazy. Danny Castillo basically does that, the epitome of that. Tony Ferguson gets the nod. I think this is something to be celebrated in MMA judging, and people go bananas. People, people act like it's the most controversial thing since, uh, I don't know what, but people act like it was a lot more controversial than it was. What did you think, Dennis? You know, Danny Castillo, um, somebody who, who's a big fan favorite, and, you know, let's, let's take that away, fans out of our mind for a second and just look at Danny as a, as a fighter without the favoritism behind him. And, you know, you'd see there clearly uh, Fergie because, you know, I like to call Tony Ferguson Fergie. Um, you, you could see clear, cl- clearly that Fergie deser- deserved to win this fight. And I remember thinking in my head as the fight was going that, you know, if MMA judging has really improved or if there's a future for MMA judging in this particular fight, Tony would walk out the winner because mm. I was 100% sure that Danny would uh, get the nod for that one. They were in Sacramento. He had a typical win- wrestling win, but I really thought that if Danny won it, it, it would show how um, slowly MMA judging is evolving. And when I saw that Tony Ferguson won it, I, I was really excited and happy because yeah. um, this, is, this is where MMA judging needs to go. And um, what, what Danny did basically was, I think he went for a safe win. I think he thought, all right, lying on top of someone will get you the win. I'm in Sacramento. I want to get, I, I want to get a win here. I'm going to lie on top of him. I don't want to lose my position. Now, this is Tony Ferguson's coming out party, in my opinion. I had, I mean, I, I, I love Tony. Watch him, The Ultimate Fighter. But I had no idea, no idea that Tony was that good on the ground. The guy looked amazing. Some of those submissions looked slick and impressive. His stand-up looked amazing. The guy just looked like a beast. And um, that Das choke that you were talking about, Caspi, you know, magnificent. He beat my career with it a couple of fights back um, at UFC 166. I don't really think people really paid Tony Ferguson much attention until now. And I think he's if he wins a couple of big fights, he might, you know, really get a following behind him. Um, you know, absolutely agree with you. Danny said, you know, I try to finish the fight. You didn't, Danny. But Danny did look good in s- certain parts in his stand-up. Now, let's not forget, Danny was a prim- primarily a wrestler, primarily a wrestler back in the day, and his striking has improved really quickly with Bang, uh, Bang L- Ludwig. But the fact of the matter is, Tony Ferguson was just that much better in the stand-up. Um, he covered up well. He had some really strong punches. Uh, Danny landed some good. Look, Danny landed some great combinations. I still think Danny looked pretty good. But you know, he when he got Tony down, and I know he was afraid of losing positions, and Tony was so slick with his submissions as well. But Danny really should have tried to ground and pound him. Really should have laid it on him. And uh, yeah, very, very, very impressed with Tony Ferguson in this fight. And yeah, I think it was a great decision. And it was it's great for MMA in general because it's going to show a lot of wrestlers that you can't just lie on top of guys anymore. You know, there's a progression happening in judging now where judges know what's happening off the bottom. If you're attacking, if you're throwing punches, if you're putting up submissions, judges are starting to catch on to that. And you're not going to be able just to lie on top of guys without throwing punches and stuff like that. So I think Tony looks really great. I'm interested to see who they put him up against next. And um, it's a tough one because like like many other MMA fans, I wish you know I'd like to see Danny make a run for the title. He's 35 years old, and he looked good in his last fight. But unfortunately, you know it's another loss on Danny's record. Hopefully, Danny doesn't take it too harshly and comes back strong. But he's got to he's got to be more uh, ferocious in those uh, in those exchanges on the ground. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, happy day for Tony Ferguson. You know, it sucks to be Danny Castillo right now, but you know, it's a good day for MMA judging, in my opinion. Um, yep. Now we got to start wrapping up because the show's going quite a while, uh, and we could probably talk forever. But you know, in the main event, you had TJ Dillashaw, the champion, obviously against Joe Soto. We've already spoken about Hannon Barrow and how unfortunate it is that he dropped out of the card. But um, Joe Soto, man, this guy, for people that, that don't know about it, I mean, he's already an accomplished bantamweight. And I think, uh, you know, he's a guy that they wanted to bring in to the UFC. He was going to be a new prospect. He was going to be making his UFC debut. And uh, they really wanted to bring him up. I mean, he was already on a, I think, six-fight win streak. Uh, he was the Tai Chi Palace Fights champion. Um, and I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got a bad memory, but I'm pretty sure he used to be a featherweight champion in the past. Sorry, sorry he was the Tai Chi Palace Fights featherweight champion as well. So, you know, he was already a stud coming in there. And I think this is a great fight. You know what I mean? He's he's a challenger. I think a lot of people thought maybe Dillashaw was going to run through 
What people don't understand is when you're training for a guy and his specific style for, you know, months and months, and he's already training for it in the previous months for the previous fight, uh, you know, you've you've got you've already got a mindset. You've got things that you've worked on specifically for that opponent. And then you, if you get a new opponent the day before, I mean, that's crazy. That really takes you back to back in the day, the days of the old school UFC when it was fight anyone, anytime. And, uh, you know, that's tough. It's really tough. It really evens the playing field. And uh, it brings it to one of those fights where anyone can win. I really had TJ Dillashaw, obviously, as the heavy favorite, as most people did. But, you know, if you can imagine, we training for a guy for three months. You know his techniques. You know what he's going to do. But it's like if you, if you get into a fight with a guy on the street. Let's say two MMA fighters got into a fight on the street. Kind of a dumb topic because they're, they're professionals anyway. But let's say it happened. One guy's whatever, fantastic grappling, the other one's a fantastic wrestler, but they know nothing about each other. You know, it really changes the game, game plan and the way the fight would go, similar to this situation. So, a lot of respect for Joe Soto. Man, he tagged TJ, TJ Dillashaw, especially in the early rounds. Good defense. He covered up a lot. TJ was very busy. He outworked him. Uh, and he got an awesome head kick KO. You know, he does that a lot. He sort of faints. You know, and we heard Bang Ludwig saying, you know, go for go for kicks, the body, and the head. And I think TJ really set it up. He was going for those body kicks. And I think maybe Joe Soto thought it was another one coming for the body. And what TJ likes to do, he likes to sort of fake that he's shooting in. He ducks in there low. He doesn't go for a shot. And instead, he comes up with a head kick. And, uh, you know, it's one of his favorite techniques. He used it against Barrow, and he's, he's beaten guys with it. And, uh, you know, yet again, we saw it against, a, 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 you know, a, a prevalent Joe Soto. But I'm actually really looking forward to seeing Joe Soto back in action. And coming into this fight, I kind of thought, you know, shit, here's another, here's another guy that could have been fighting for the title, that could have brought him up slowly. Now he's going to lose because he's on such short notice. And, you know, it's going to be a really tough sell to, to make the title fight again if he does have success in the UFC. I don't think it's a tough sell. I think it's going to be a really easy sell if you show that replay. You know, in, in a year or whenever the case is, if he comes up for a title shot of him, you know, rocking or whatever, hitting TJ Dillashaw, landing those shots and have Joe Rogan, you know, talking about this guy stepped up on one day notice. <laughs> he is literally, you know, this and that. I think uh, I think these guys might fight in the future. But Joe Soto showed that, you know, in, in this last minute sort of scuffle of, of, you know, and shuffle of all these opponents, he's he's ready to, to you know, hang in there in the, in the bantamweight division. I mean... Not only the fact that he was training for a three-round fight, and he got a five-round fight, and he only got finished in the fifth round. Hats off to Joe Soto, and, uh, you know, congratulations to TJ. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, you know, um, absolutely, Cass. Uh, Joe Soto sh showed his heart. Um, Bellator sort of trying to troll the UFC a little bit by replaying the Joe Warren fight where Joe knocked him out. Um, in the second round with uh, knees and punches. Um, you know, I have to disagree with you a little bit, Cass. I don't think that um, uh, I don't think that Dillashaw came in um, because he because he didn't prepare for Soto. I don't think he had much. I don't think he had as much of a disadvantage as Soto had against Dillashaw, especially because the guys trained together for a bit. Um, they probably had a few bit of a spar. I think Dill I think Soto is a bit is pretty predictable. Um, he's a striker that wrestles, but. Um, I thought I thought he was amazing, man. I, I agree with you. I think Soto did a really really good job. Um, I'm really impressed with him. I, I'm impressed that he st uh, stood up on on one day's notice. I think that um, he's got a lot of potential, and I think that uh, he, he had a lot of parts in the fight where he actually got the better of T.J. Dillashaw. Um, T a lot of T.J.'s punches and kicks landed across his guard and didn't actually um, hit him. And I think that there were some certain certain concerns and certain parts of the fight. I thought that Joe landed some great hooks, some great punches, and he looked really really good. And yeah, that knockout. It was really good for Dillashaw as well, um, but it was actually a pretty exciting fight. And when people started watching that fight, a lot of people started saying, "Oh, you never know what's going to happen. Maybe Soto will win." And there were a couple of parts, you know, a couple of rounds there where um, I know a lot of people were excited, thinking that Soto would win. Um, it, I think it does absolutely elevate Soto, and uh, it'll be interesting to see who they give him next. But um, yeah, a great win for T uh, J Dillashaw. At least it was. A, a great time there in Sacramento. And Cass, I, I, I didn't hear properly when I was watching the event, but did they, did they say something about um, Team Alpha Male selling like 700 tickets to the event or something? Did, yeah, did was, Mike Goldberg was, say something like that? It was Angel's Camp, and they sold 700 tickets. Mike Goldberg said two charter buses. I don't know what that means because I don't know any bus that can hold 350 <laughs> people. Um, but, yeah, no, 700, 700 uh 700 tickets from Angel's Camp, which is obviously where TJ Dillashaw's from, and I believe Uriah Faber as well, all, oh, yeah. all those guys. 
And uh, that apparently is like 30% of the town. So that's wow. crazy. Joe Rogan you, made a good point. What do they do with the town? You know, who's who's in the shops? Who, who's doing anything? I'm picturing like, you know, a uh, <laughs> what's that thing in the desert when, when there's like an awkward moment and that thing uh, rolls through the screen? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. The um, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly right. And you know, you got to give it to TJ Dillashaw. He knew that maybe not that many people would be buying tickets to the event, <laughs> so they, they they did their part and sold some tickets, which is good. Now I'm kidding. I'm sure it would have sold out really well. But um, I think I think it's a great one for TJ Dillashaw. And I know that we're running out of time, but just quickly, I heard that they said that Brow's not going to get another title shot and not the immediate title shot because he missed weight. Interesting yeah. to see what happens there, who they match him up with. Obviously, uh, Uriah Faber, someone who wanted to rematch with him. So, hey, things up in the air. Very interesting. And um, it was, yeah, it was an interesting night. Yeah, Dana White, you know, he, he gets very shitty with guys who don't make weight. And I think, I'm not putting words in his mouth at all, just my opinion. I think I think it's a case of, you know, Barrow had so long to prepare and he, for whatever reason, he, he whether he didn't prepare correctly or whatever, he didn't make the weight. And I think, uh, yeah. You know, especially especially when you're building a pay per view around this, and the guy falls out. I don't think Dana White wants to put his faith in a guy like that. Mm. No, no disrespect to Burrell whatsoever. But you know what? That's us for another week, guys. Um, just before we go, big thank you to all our guests. Big thank you for uh, for Dan Seven for coming on the show. As we said earlier, check out the full interview. It's a big one. It's like a shoot interview. The guy talks about everything from his WWE career to UFC. Uh, a lot of a lot of interesting tidbits of the early UFCs and just the way it was. Talks about performance enhancing drugs and things like that. And of course, his own uh, his own school, massive facility. If you want to come train with Dan Seven, definitely check that out. Thank you to Jim Ross. Uh, interesting as always. Sorry that we went over time, but it is always an absolute pleasure and honor to have JR on the show. And of course, Jason Perillo, really insightful guy. One of the coolest guys that's been on the show. Um, awesome guy. So uh, yeah, if you, guys, if you guys enjoy the show, by all means, subscribe. Give us a like. Check us out on Twitter, submission AUS. Uh, we're very friendly. We always chat to everybody. And of course, Kit Dale, uh, the war child, or as we found out, he's got a new nickname. Check that out. It's on our YouTube channel, or will be on our YouTube channel any 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 day now, any hour now. Check that out. Really fun interview and a really uh, really hilarious tap out round. Yeah, that's right. You know, and and Kit Dale speaks about um, PDs and grappling, which is uh, something that I'm interested in. You know, you and me, Cass, we do a lot of grappling, do a lot of stuff like that. So it's always something that I'm interested to see what people think about that. And, you know, check that out. And apart from that, Cass, I think that's it. Um, another really great episode of Submission Radio. And thanks to all the fans, like you mentioned, who jumped on Twitter, uh, tweeted us at, at, at Submission AUS and checked us out on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Submission Radio AU. And obviously we're available. Um, if you guys, this is the first time that you've listened to us, we're available on Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, and uh, YouTube. So make sure you check all that out. Thank, again, thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. And uh, obviously, check us out on Twitter because we always let you know when the guests are coming on. And uh, thank you to all the, thank you to everyone who basically put in their guest questions and had questions for JR and Jason Perillo. Again, uh, check us out Twitter at submission AUS, and we'll let you know when we have uh, the guests on and when you can ask questions. Again, another good week. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Yeah.